please help me in welcoming Jose Martin. Thank you, Ms. Shipley, and good afternoon to everybody. <clears throat> yeah, boy, 30 years of practice, I was getting asked the other day, bet it went by like nothing. No, no, it, it feels like 30 years. I mean, it, think back, 27 to 57 years of age, yeah. That's, that's a lot of water under the bridge. Hopefully it's given me some experience that I can share with you. The presentation today has to do with essentially how to provide special education FAPE in a virtual setting, hopefully identifying what, what issues we might have to overcome that create some difficulty and maybe explore some ideas on how to overcome those particular issues. I do wanna tell you in the broad scope of the presentation what I'm gonna to try to accomplish. <clears throat> Initially, it's, I do wanna cover various forms of virtual programs that may be out there. I suspect that the reason I was asked about virtual programs for students in special education is because the COVID pandemic has essentially forced the entire educational system in the United States to essentially go online, go virtual for varied amounts of time. And many schools have now reopened, but, but certainly a lot of schools across the United States went through a significant period of virtual programming. And then depending on, on the state, some states, including mine, are allowing parents to opt to remain in remote or virtual programming even after the school reopens, we'll explore the issues related there. But even before the pandemic, there was already a proliferation of virtual schools and a proliferation of students with disabilities participating in the virtual schools. And, and so I'll also explore the issues of, of what if, what if a, a school district wants to create maybe a virtual charter program as, as part of its offerings, or what if the state wants to investigate a virtual charter program that's open enrollment and available to any student uh, in the state, um, uh, what would you do about the participation of special education students there? So I'm kind of covering all those issues. I'm, you know, that may be the virtual kids that are remaining because they're opting to stay virtual, or perhaps some of your districts haven't reopened, or you've had to reclose, um, or the state is maybe thinking of creating virtual programs in, in your state, which is a possibility since you guys are kind of sparsely populated and there are significant distances uh, involved in your state. I'll try to cover all of those, those issues. The data that exists is indicative that we have more online and virtual education going on in elementary and secondary education programs, uh, public programs in the United States. Not quite clear on how many special education students are participating, but my feel and the reading of the data is that that is increasing. That some parents either, you know, unhappy with the social atmosphere of the school or the peer atmosphere of the school uh, are deciding for, for virtual programming. And then of course you have students with disabilities that were already on virtual programming even before the pandemic because they had some immune condition or some other kind of condition that rendered them particularly susceptible to infection, okay? So certainly there are benefits to, to virtual programs. And a little bit we'll talk about, you know, when we talk virtual, exactly what types of programs are we referring to? It's really more than one, but certainly the benefits for a, per, a purely virtual program, one that is asynchronous as we'll see is the student can kind of self pace through the program and, and has greater control of the learning process. If it's a purely virtual program where the student accesses the learning modules on their own, it's not synchronous to anything, then the student could decide well, I'm gonna do more in the afternoon and evening and not so much in the morning. Of course, in a purely, purely virtual program, that's just learning modules that are sent to the student, that they, there's, there's no peer distractions or conflicts because obviously in, in either a remote learning environment or a synchronous virtual environment like Zoom-based lessons, but you still can have peer distractions I and mean, you're seeing and hearing kids and that potentially can still happen. As I indicated, the virtual program option or remote learning option 
is certainly a viable option for kids that have health issues that predispose them to potential infection. And that's gonna continue for a while, uh, even after schools have reopened, because you're gonna have parents whose doctors tell them, well, your child has this respiratory condition or this heart condition or some other immune condition that places them at higher risk of serious illness should they get COVID. So even though the school has reopened, the pandemic is still to some degree ongoing and, and there's a concern if your child goes to school. So that doctor may sign medical exception forms that keep the student on, on virtual programming. So these kinds of students would fall under this category. Another benefit of virtual programming is that it allows for instruction in rural areas that might not be available otherwise, because obviously the internet can reach anywhere that the signal can reach. And so you can actually provide a quite sophisticated panoply of courses in, you know, ideally or theoretically that might be available in very remote rural areas where the schools are quite small and they might not have the resources to create specific programs of that type, maybe in advanced calculus programs, advanced elective economics programs, for example. Uh, other benefits are that you can still achieve, hopefully, differentiated instruction on a virtual basis. The student hopefully can receive ongoing feedback as to how they're doing, either by uh, kind of grading their own work or their work is graded in return to them on an electronic basis. As I indicated, students can kind of schedule their work more flexibly. There can be multimodal presentation of content similar in the classroom environment because you can do visual things obviously on the web and you can do auditory things on the web as well. Uh, tactile things can, can happen, but they'll happen remotely. So, you know, the student might be sent a tactile uh, model, for example, to work with at home, uh, but you're not going to have obviously the tactile group instruction in, in the school setting. Cost savings, you know, I've been asked in general whether the virtual programs are cost savers or actually will it, where they will cost more. My feel is that the jury is out on that. Now we're not quite sure whether we can say uh, virtual or online programs with respect to special education students definitely involve cost savings because I don't think that's necessarily the case in all situations. So you know, we'll have to figure out about that. And that's why I put a question mark besides that, that point. I, I do think virtual programs, online programs, bring a, a number of challenges forward to schools. Boy, am I say, stating the obvious. I am sure that all of you have experienced the challenges uh, to providing special education services on a virtual basis. And, you know, I think it's very, a very new situation that happened last spring in the United States when schools had to essentially close and create virtual programs on the fly and turning on a dime and becoming virtual providers of special education services. I do think that the major problem is we don't know legally in many situations how the law operates with respect to these virtual programs. And that's because the, the present IDEA law is entirely premised on group instruction in brick and mortar public schools. The, the current version of the law that we have is 17 years old. And 17 years ago, no, the Congress did not envision that there would be this growth and expansion in virtual programs and thus there are no provisions in the law that even appear to envision the idea of virtual programs. So what you find is that in some areas of law, there's some friction. We don't know exactly what to do with virtual programs and how things are supposed to fit. And you'll see that I'll, when we get to the section on, on LRE, I indicate we, we don't know exactly how LRE works in the virtual context. Uh, another, another challenge of of virtual programs as an educational setting for students in special education is that we have to understand that remote learning, virtual learning, online learning has certain inherent qualities. And, and the nature of virtual programs is such that 
it's not going to be possible to provide an appropriate education to every child with disabilities through a virtual program type of setting. I've surprised some by saying that, but we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, no setting that is part of the continuum of placements in special education is expected to be able to address the needs of all special education students. The regular classroom cannot address the needs of all special education students. The resource classroom can't either. No setting is gonna be able to fully address the need of all kinds of special education settings of all kinds of special education students. That's why we have a continuum of placements and that's why we mix and match them. And I do think that you're gonna see me go back to that point. I think that certain, certain students are just not good candidates for the receipt of appropriate instruction and to make appropriate progress in a virtual or online type of program. And, I, and I'm sure that we have experienced that in the last year. Uh, that's you know, part of the reason why the Department of Education is saying you're going to find some kids that are having learning loss and you're going to have to provide some form of compensatory services to those kids. Okay, let's get to this point. I've, I've hinted at it. Um, there's different types of programs that kind of are beamed into the home setting. Uh, I kind of break them down as follows. There's kind of virtual fully online programs and I see those as fully asynchronous these lesson modules that are there, you open them on your own, they contain the instruction, the assignments, you do that on your own. Um, it, there's communication with your instructor, but only by email or phone. You turn in your assignments electronically, you take in your assignments electronically, the teacher may be asleep when you're actually accessing a lesson. Okay, I see that as fully, fully virtual, fully, fully online. Then remote, remote, I see, you know, that's a term that I'll give to what instruction that's like easily synchronous. Okay, and that's where the teacher is providing live instruction in a classroom setting. And remote students are participating by camera or mi and microphone so that the actual live classroom environment, the desks, the Blackboard, everything is being beamed into the student's computer simply by use of, a, of an appropriate camera. And the camera may have two fields, one focusing on the blackboard or perhaps more, more likely the PowerPoint projector. And, and the other field is broader of the classroom or maybe focused on, on the teacher. And the kids can hear all the instruction, view all the audio visuals, and here the students can raise their hand electronically through some signal so that the teacher can hear them and they can hear the teacher if they ask a question or if they are participating in discuss discussion. I'll, I'll call that kind of just remote because you're really attending remotely to the same classroom that you would otherwise attend live. And then I think that a lot of schools did the following, which is live online, okay? Which is, you know, Zoom-based instruction um, can be synchronous or asynchronous. It can be happening all at the same time or not. Um, peers appear on the platform from their homes. The kids might see all their peers as you see me, okay? And through the, through the platform and can be heard, you know, every peer, every student can be heard and students obviously are hearing the teacher. Uh, assignments obviously are turned in electronically and I see that as sort of live online, okay? And of course, you could have a combination thereof, okay? So even think about it, even within the context or of, of virtual slash remote slash home instruction, there appears to be a continuum as well, where you know you see that it could be fully virtual, asynchronous, or it could be just remote, but live instruction is going on, or it could be live yet online with Zoom-based type of, of instruction, where the teacher is at home and everybody else is at home as well. That I think I think for me, there unless you unless you tell me otherwise in your comments, these appear to be the the types 
of, of programs that, that I've seen. You'll see that some of the cases that I deal with, the programs are, are fully over here in, in the virtual and online, uh, whereas other cases have to do with more live online types of, of services. I haven't seen cases yet on a lot of remote instruction, and I'm not sure why, why school districts aren't engaging in remote instruction, because I do think it has its benefits. Uh, remote instruction is not only synchronous, but you are, you are viewing the regular classroom environment and all of your peers in their natural environment, which to me would seem to be the closest thing to being in the classroom setting. Uh, but we'll see this idea of a continuum of placements within virtual and being part of LRE, that, that's an idea out of my own head. I think we're going to have to confront it in a future reauthorization because the Congress is simply going to have to acknowledge the advent of virtual programming, which I think is only going to exponentially increase from now on. As now, most parents in the United States have had experience with virtual programming, you're gonna have some parents that think it's a great option and they're gonna want it to continue, maybe for the regular ed kids, maybe for their special ed kids as well. Yeah, I have to touch on equity and access issues because I have to. If you create a virtual program, let's say you, you decide that as part of your school district offerings, there's gonna be some virtual offerings. Section 504, which is the non-discrimination law, means you cannot categorically or arbitrarily deny or exclude students with disabilities from participation in the virtual program. That shouldn't surprise you. If you create an extra a new extracurricular activities, could you ban special education students? Of course not. Both under Section 504 and IDEA, if you create opportunities, you have to make them equally accessible to students with disabilities. You cannot categorically or arbitrarily deny them participation. Now, a key issue I want to bring up is that if you do create a virtual program, either one that's associated with your school district or the state decide to, decides to create, let's say, a virtual school, a virtual school district, it doesn't exist in bricks and mortars, but it's a virtual charter, as you'll see examples of this type of program, that proper admission or screening policies are probably appropriate. They have to be designed to avoid categorical arbitrary discrimination, but I think appropriate admission standards serve to screen for students who are good candidates to receive a FAPE on a virtual basis and also will uh, not admit students who we know by on the basis of evaluation data and their individual needs, that they're not the type of student who's gonna be able to make appropriate progress in a virtual setting. As I indicated, I think that's a foundation proposition. You're not gonna be able to meet the needs of every special education student in a virtual setting. We'll talk about what kinds of students I think are not good candidates in a little bit. Uh, here's an example of how discrimination works. This is a virtual program that's part of a Washington district. Washington School District actually contracted with this virtual program and, and, and basically entrusted it to, to serve students that wanna go on virtual. It's a Quillayute Valley, I'm sure I killed that in Washington. This is an OCR case. So notice it's written criteria. So to enter the program, you cannot need modified curriculum. You can't need counseling. You can't need paraprofessional support. And you can't need more than 40 minutes a week of special ed services. And if you need some tech devices, you're out also. And that was the written criteria. So the actual written criteria said, if you need this stuff, need not apply, okay? And then OCR found that aside from the written criteria, there were some unwritten kind of under the table criteria. And that was, was even broader. If your reading and writing levels were below sixth grade, you were, you were not gonna be allowed in the program. And if, you, and if you were unable to work independently also, you were gonna be disallowed from entering the program. OCR said, the admission criteria is discriminatory. It goes beyond admission criteria that's necessary to achieve the mission and goals of the education program, which is to provide a FAPE to the students with disabilities and provide an education to, to students without disabilities. 
when you apply criteria that only applies to students with disabilities, it's more likely to be seen as discriminatory. Okay, but well, the point that I want to make about Quileute is that they are very ham handed in their admissions approach. Because if you notice it, if, if you're if the idea, for example, we're not going to take any special ed student that needs more than 40 minutes a week of special ed services, you're categorically denying services to probably, a, you know, most students in special ed even students with a moderate learning disability are gonna need more than 40 minutes a week of special ed services. So you're just not wanting special ed students in your program, unless they're super smart and only need accommodations. So the, that's, that's too broad. A, a, a student in, that is in special education that has a learning disability that needs 40 minutes um, or more of special ed services that needs some counseling and that and that has a reading level below sixth grade can still participate in a virtual program and make appropriate progress. I, I, you know, the kinds of students that I think can't receive a FAPE in this, in this type of a program, um, that does, it doesn't include that type of a student. This, this criteria is too ham-handed. It's, it's, it's not surgically trying to ensure that students that can't get an education don't try and futility in the program. Here, you're just taking a hatchet and you're saying, we don't want the vast majority of special ed kids. I do think there are ways of incorporating some of the program's valid concerns in ways that aren't discriminatory. Like notice this one down here. They're concerned about students that lack the ability to work independently. What do I think about that? That's pretty valid. You know, in a virtual program, if you as a student need a, a lot of prodding and prompting and one-to-one -one assistance to do your work and you have zero ability to do work independently, then you're probably not a good candidate for the virtual program. Because as I'll explain, it does expect students to work independently. I mean, most programs do to some degree, but the virtual program, I think even to a greater degree. So I do think that's a valid concern. I do think that would be a valid admission criteria. If the student has very low ability to work independently, then that's a factor that kind of is going to tell you they're going to struggle in, in a virtual program because it doesn't offer that kind of hands-on physical assistance that might happen in a live classroom environment, especially if the inability to work independently is, is severe. It's quite extreme, as you'll find. Okay. A point on open enrollment virtual programs. I have found in, in presenting on virtual programs, and this is an interest of mine, I actually became interested in special education and virtual programs way before the pandemic. I think that it was in 2016 that I presented at LRP on special education and virtual programs. And have learned since then that some states have funded open enrollment virtual programs, okay? So they have, you know, allowed a charter program to open entirely virtually. And open enrollment meaning first come first or anybody that comes, comes one, come all, you can apply and you can get in. Any kind of a special education student anywhere in the state can apply to this virtual enrollment program on an open enrollment basis, no questions asked, okay? And the dilemma that I find uh, for these schools and obviously the states that, that they're in is that if there are no admission criteria to screen out students who are conclusively not gonna be good candidates to receive a FAPE in the virtual setting, these virtual programs may in fact have to serve students that are impossible to serve virtually. And, and these programs are gonna not be able to provide an appropriate education to these students. And they're gonna be exposed to liability under IDA because they're not providing an appropriate education. So I actually think that this type of model is not workable, okay? And the model that I mean is you're opening as a virtual program and any student in special education can get in because that type of model denies the foundation point I stated earlier, which is that some students 
their needs and the inherent nature of the virtual program are in opposition and a virtual program will never be able to provide them an appropriate education, which again, I told you, shouldn't surprise us because not every type of setting is for every type of special education student. And I'll give you some examples. There's a case out of Pennsylvania, Commonwealth Connections Academy. So this is an open enrollment type of virtual program charter school. And notice this student, this student comes in and the student is other health impaired. So he's under IDEA, other health impaired by virtue of ADHD, not uncommon, okay? I'm commonly asked students with ADHD, are they 504 or special ed? I always answer, I don't know. It depends on the student. Some students with ADHD need special education services. Okay, so those will go into special ed as OHI. Some students, they just need accommodations, for example, maybe a behavior support plan that can be handled under 504. Okay, so this student transferred from a regular district to this open enrollment virtual program charter, VP meaning virtual program, okay, in terms of an acronym. His existing IEP from the brick and mortar environment had direct special ed services in social skills and special ed instruction in organizational skills and math. Probably math was a particularly weak area. This virtual program primarily provided services by the means of students on their own accessing software programs, self-paced. Students had live lectures they could attend and they actually also had recorded lectures that they could attend on their own. For students that needed some additional support, the program provided virtual support from a learning support teacher. And you know, think of your inclusion service students, likely over the past year, some of these students that were served virtually, well, you had to kind of translate, how do we do inclusion services in a virtual program? And you probably did it on this basis with a, a special ed teacher checking in with the student electronically, maybe on Zoom basis and providing the assistance in that fashion that would normally be provided by that teacher going into the regular education classroom. But notice what happened here was the student wasn't taking advantage of the learning support teacher and he started falling behind and failing. So the virtual program, to their credit, they provided him what they call the supplemental support programs, some, some, uh, some effort at providing additional assistance. And they added it to his program, but they did it without an IEP meeting. Then the parent got fed up and said, uh, we, don't want, we don't want the additional support. Apparently at one point, the charter school even said, we'll send somebody to the home to provide assistance. The parent said, no, I don't want somebody in the home. The hearing officer, found liability, the hearing officer, the parents filed for a due process hearing, they sued the district. And the hearing officer said, yeah, the school didn't provide services that were comparable to the prior IEP. They didn't address the fact that there was a need for direct instruction in social skills, organizational skills, and math. They only provided sort of like the coursework with software programs, live lectures, and recordings of lectures. And then they just provided support kind of as the student needed in order to get by in class, but not specifically to address social skill needs, organizational needs, and math, which was a significant area of deficit. Notice what the hearing officer said. Soon after enrolling, it became apparent the student's attention and organizational deficits would interfere with online learning. Who could have predicted that? Everybody, anybody. You know, I mean, you have a student that probably the the, the, the information and the documentation from the previous district told them, okay, this student is frequently off task, gets distracted, and we should know that if a student is distractible, distractible and, and likely to get off task in a learning setting, the virtual program is probably not a good thing, okay, because um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to determine if the student is off task and there may be more opportunities for distraction because there's kind of home noises going on or your cat might have jumped on your lap or whatever the case may be. And so the hearing officer found 
that they hadn't provided the services that were previously on the IEP, and they also committed some procedural violations. Yeah, I mean, very nice that you added these support services, but you have to do that in an IEP team meeting. I mean, that's that's special ed procedure 101. And sometimes these charter programs, they don't they don't know procedures. Notice the hearing officer awards a thousand hours of comp ed. How much is that? A lot. Boy, by the time they discharge that, okay, that, that's gonna take that's gonna take some time. You see what, what you have? You have a student that is has the right to be in this program that will not meet his needs. Okay, he's way off task, can't do work independently. There's no way that the, a, a virtual program is gonna work for the student. But since the programs come one, come all, they have to take them. And they have to admit a student who they know is not gonna work out in the program. That's, that's the dilemma of the open enrollment virtual program. Here's another one, Cincinnati Learning School. So a teacher, as, I'm sorry, a teenager, this is a case out of Ohio, he en enrolls in an online charter and this online charter does offer a resource room that I guess provides specialized instruction to supplement what the regular virtual program provides. But as they put the IEP together to put the student in this online program, the IEP did not state the amount of time the student would be in the virtual resource room. And often the student didn't attend. He's, he's missing work a lot. He's logging in inconsistently. So the hearing officer, here's the procedural problem. They say, wait a minute. The, the program doesn't state the specific amount of special ed services. And that's, not, that's not appropriate. And it leaves it up to the student how much uh, resource room assistance the student's going to get is entirely to whether the student wants ops to get the research room instruction or not. And despite the, the fact that the student was missing loads of work, the, the school didn't hold the follow-up IEP team meeting. That's crucial, that's crucial. You know, I, I say frequently that sometimes when we look at special education cases, we get caught in the minutia and the technicalities of special education cases. And, and I advise that you don't, okay? Mostly a lot of cases are won or lost on whether the school district took action when there was a problem, okay? So a lot of times, you know, I, I work with schools and ask them, is there a problem? And they'll tell me, yes. And I tell them, I'll tell you what you need to do. What? Something, okay? Do something, okay? Meet and talk about the problem and do something. Uh, I'll note here, is it bad that the virtual program places a high responsibility on the student? I mean, is that contrary to IDEA? Well, to a certain degree, I think that it is. And if, if it, it, in this system, the adults have to decide how much special ed instruction the student needs. The student doesn't get to be his own IEP team, right? Okay. If you're in an IEP team meeting, you say, you need to be in resource class two hours a day. Do you then look to the student and say, is that okay with you? And then the student says, no, nah, I only wanna be in there 30 minutes. Okay, 30 minutes, that's not how it works. And the way the system works is the big people tell the little people what, what has to happen, right? Um, because we're the IEP team, we're the education professionals, we're the ones that know about the student's needs. The student is not the judge of, of whether he needs assistance or not. So taken to an extreme, that can happen. Now, getting, getting some student input into it, that's fine, but ultimately the decision has to be made by, by the adults, okay? If, if you have uh, one a variable amount of services for a child, for example, uh, you want the student to access additional support, um, but you're not sure how much they're gonna need, you could state a minimum of, and then the student has to access it a minimum of uh, X amount of minutes per week, um, <clears throat> and there it can be higher. But you want the IEP to set forth a specific commitment of resources that it's clear that you're gonna set forth, okay? And we don't, that's, I don't like accommodations upon student requests, for example, because again, it, it, the student may not make a good decision about those types of issues. <clears throat> Another example, I got a Pennsylvania. You can see how there's a lot of virtual programs proliferating in a variety of states. We think talked about several states now. So this student has, uh, this is a difficult combination. The student has an emotional disturbance and also has 
some specific learning disabilities and he enrolls in a virtual program. And you can see right off the bat, there's gonna be problems because the student has a history of school avoidance, of resisting work and resisting going to school, okay? I've seen this situation before. The parents having trouble getting the student to school. So the parent surrenders and the parent says, what about we try not going to school and, look, and looking at a virtual program? But that is an illusory proposition because a student has a history of school avoidance. I think actually in a virtual program, you you're, you're have an easier time avoiding because you can just turn, you know, close the, the computer lid. Or, you know, or leave the room. So unsurprisingly, in the virtual program, the students started not participating and failed many classes. And the problem here was that the virtual program, again, didn't hold an IEP team meeting and didn't amend the IEP to address the students' participation problems. Notice the quote, the charter committed to apply its online model to the student and that relied upon the child to access instruction. That can be an appropriate model for its regular education students, but it can't be for the special education students. You have a responsibility to implement the student's IEP and ensures that he receives the necessary special ed instruction. Uh, it is no defense to say, oh, we had, we had the services there. He simply didn't access them. I guess they thought that was a good defense. It's not. Any hearing officer is gonna say, what'd you do about it? That's a big problem. Did you have an IEP team meeting? Did you discuss the issue? Did you put together a behavior support plan? Did you interact with the parent? Okay. What are we going to try to get this student to participate? You know, before maybe concluding the student's not appropriate. But remember, in these open enrollment programs, you have to take the student. You just can't kick the student out um, because they're not doing well. Okay. And, and you know, and ostensibly, that, that can be a problem because again, in some situations, you're not gonna be able to serve the student on a virtual basis. So I see some problems with these open enrollment virtual programs if, if, the, if the state of Wyoming is thinking about it. And that is that I think there's gonna be a tendency where truant students, students that are in special education, but they're often missing class or missing, uh, from certain courses, classes because they're skipping or they don't get to school or they're resistant to going to school or they may be in the classroom, but they're resistant to doing their work. And sometimes they're enrolled by the parents into the virtual program as an alternative to attendance. But it doesn't work because their, their, their school resistance just manifests maybe to an even stronger degree in the virtual program. If the parent has trouble getting the, the student to school, and the instructional staff have student have problems getting the student to attend to instruction, it's going to be very difficult in the virtual program, where obviously a parent may have other things to do beside monitoring the child's participation. I, I worry about kids that have a lot of off-task tendencies and virtual programs. I worry about kids that have a low capacity to do work independently when the virtual program requires a lot of that, you know? Um, kids that have low motivation, kids that are school resistant. I mean, these are just not going to be good candidates for a virtual program. It distances them from the actual teacher. It, it allows them that they can simply go off camera and, and, you know, what can the teacher do other than email the parent and say, he went off camera for X amount of time. I also think that in if, if parents aren't willing and able to function as learning coaches that are assisting and ensuring that the student logs on and the student is on task for an appropriate period of time, then, then the situation is not gonna function. Uh, students that need a lot of significant hands, hands-on instruction, hand-over-hand -hand type of, of assistance, students with more severe disabilities, I think might not be good candidates because they need a lot of close proximity physical instruction which you're not gonna be able to do on a virtual basis, okay? Um, and just thinking of the types of students that aren't gonna work out. There's others, there's others we'll talk about as well because I, I wanna make the point a little later on that students with significant social skills deficits will also suffer in a virtual program. Because it's difficult to get social skills instruction across when you're in a setting where you're not actually in the physical presence of other students, that's gonna be difficult. Okay, I indicated 
that with respect to virtual programs, um, there, there still has to be compliance with all IDEA and Section 504 requirements, okay? Uh, I'll assume that if, if you're educating a special ed student virtually, all IDEA or 504 requirements, if they're a 504, stu stu if they're a 504 student, all these requirements apply to them. For example, you know, IEP progress reports, they're required whether you're virtual or not. But remember, the problem is that these laws envision that kids are actually in physical brick and mortar schools. And case law is only starting to come out on how the legal requirements of IDEA are expected to apply to virtual programs. And, and, and let's see, the Department of Education's position just states the obvious point that I make earlier on this slide. And that's that the rights and protections of students with disabilities under IDA cannot be diminished or compromised when they attend a virtual program. And they point out that that includes child find, okay? That child find applies in virtual programs, although they recognize that it may present unique challenges in the virtual program context. And, and that's, that's a good, that's a good piece for discussion. Some of you for months had virtual programming. During that period of virtual programming during which you had COVID closures for your schools, your child find obligations did not go away. The, you still had students that you worried about their performance and you suspected they have disabilities and you still had an obligation to engage in child find and to approach the parents with a referral under IDEA, even if it meant you can't quite evaluate them right now because we would need them to be able to come to a face-to-face -face environment to evaluate them. But I wanna point that out. The child find requirement, and that was my, my previous session, with the Department of Education. It applies in the virtual context, albeit it's a little bit more difficult because you don't have hands on the student and you might have eyes on the student, but just through the Zoom lens, okay? Um, notice this program, this is just a 504 case. This is Virtual Community School of Ohio. You'll see that this, this virtual program out of Ohio got hit with a, a couple of lawsuits. This one was an OCR complaint. This is a fully virtual program, okay? Like a fully virtual charter program. And look the way they handled 504. So if kids came in and were 504, their plans were developed informally just between the 504 coordinator with discussion with the parents. Sometimes the 504 coordinator talked with the prior school, sometimes not. And there was never a meeting. There was never an actual 504 meeting at which it was determined with a committee of knowledgeable persons, that being a 504 team. What's a 504 team? A team that includes persons that are knowledgeable about the child, knowledgeable about the information regarding the child, and knowledgeable about what options you can put together in, in, an, in a 504 plan. And here, they, it just happened informally without any meetings. Sometimes, the coordinator would go so far as to say, ah, we're not gonna do the 504 plan unless you go to your doctor and you get us some diagnosis of your child's disabilities. Is that okay? No, it's not okay under section 504. The evaluation duties are the school's duties. So the OCR was forced to find that there was no, no child find process, no, no reevaluations, very spotty in terms of notifying parents of their rights. And the 504 plans weren't examined um, and what OCR envisioned was if you have a student coming in from a live setting and they're coming into the virtual setting, well, that live 504 plan is going to have to be translated into what the virtual program provides. And those accommodations might have to be adjusted for the virtual program because those some of those accommodations aren't going to apply in the virtual program or they're gonna to have to be tweaked, translated into, into the virtual context. So if you note the note I say is OCR understands the concept that when you have 
special ed and 504 students moving into a virtual setting, their plans will have to be adapted to fit into the online education setting. A topic we'll address later, which is some ideas on how do you adapt it? How do you translate the services that are normally provided physically in proximity or in a live educational environment into the virtual model? Because you have to translate them to where they're roughly equal. They're roughly sufficient, okay? Um, notice, I also noticed what the school website said, and maybe they regretted it. The school website said, we're an ideal scenario for students with disabilities, including students from school removed from school due to disciplinary reasons. And I indicate in the slide, that might be oversell. Can the virtual program be appropriate for any type of student? Absolutely not, like we just talked about. We just saw examples of students that were not a good fit. In fact, to the contrary, I think any school website uh, about virtual programs has to indicate we might not be an ideal scenario for all kinds of students with disabilities. Certain students with disabilities will have certain needs that are just not going to be a good fit with the inherent nature of virtual programs. And that's why I advocate that if, if a school district creates a virtual program, that there be some admission process through the IEP team to determine if the student is a good candidate to receive FAPE in that, in that program. Because if not, I don't think that, that the IEP team should agree or approve of the child going to a virtual program if we don't think his IEP can be implemented there or we don't think he can receive a, a, FAPE, a, a FAPE there, okay? So that's oversell there. Uh, notice what the courts think of, of LRE and virtual programs. So this school was trying to argue, this is a case out of District of Columbia. District of Columbia has a lot of special education cases, and this one went to federal court. The school was trying to argue, when we moved them, from a virtual program to a regular school environment, that was not a change in placement because <clears throat> we didn't change the IEP. The IEP services, the goals, the accommodations, they weren't changed. So we just moved them from the virtual program back to a live campus environment. And the court said, that sounds like a change in placement to me. Notice the quote of the court, you'll forgive me for reading it, clearly shifting for from what is essentially a completely individualized instructional setting that's separate from other students to a traditional school setting does constitute a change in the plaintiff's then current educational placement. And the question that I've raised in the past in previous sessions is, does this analysis apply in the COVID pandemic situation where all students had to go home to receive services? Was that a change in play when the school closed and all students had to go to remote services, was that a change in placement for all students? And it does appear that the emerging analysis in federal courts is that not in that situation, because that was a system-wide decision, okay? And it applied to all students. So that's not, it wasn't really a change in placement. It was something completely different and, and unusual and unprecedented, okay? As we'll starting to see. Yes, Ms. Shipley. Can you unmute yourself? I can now. <laughs> I have a question that I will read. It says, we have talked about students that are not good candidates for FAPE in a virtual program. And I hear you say things like the IEP team, the IEP, I'm getting more questions It's scrolling down. The IEP team shouldn't have agreed to those plans. In an open enrollment situation, what do you recommend? If all students in the district have the option to choose the virtual program, do we tell the students with disabilities that they don't have the right to make that choice when all other students do? Yes. I, I hope you're not surprised that my answer is, we can't say yes to an instructional setting and a, and a, and a decision for a student to enter into a placement that we know will not provide him an appropriate education. 
I hope that doesn't surprise you. The, the fact that some students, maybe regular education students can opt for a virtual program does not mean that the virtual program is appropriate on an individualized basis for a certain special education student, okay? If, if the student's IEP cannot be met in that program or the, the student's individualized disability related needs are such that they're in opposition to what that program provides, the IEP team has a duty to tell the student you can't go there. And it's not discrimination to protect a student's right to FAPE. The IEP team has a duty to provide a FAPE and cannot allow a student by virtue of making a voluntary option to deny himself an appropriate public education. Now that's, that's not how non-discrimination works. You have equal access to that program if it meets your needs. That shouldn't surprise you. Let me put it this way to you. Isn't it discriminatory to tell a special education student, you can't be on the football team? Okay, let's say that student has zero skills and he's gonna get smushed on the football, on the football field. The, the school district would have a duty to hold a tryout and figure out if the kid's any good. Equal access means you have certain capacities and certain skill sets that enable you to be able to play as part of the football team. That's why there's a tryout process. And it's not discriminatory, it's not discriminatory to tell a student, you can try out, but if you don't make it, you don't make it. And it's not discriminatory to tell a student, the IEP team can consider your request to go into a virtual program. But before that happens, the IEP team has to approve it. And not approving it in protection of the student's right to FAPE is not discriminatory you are looking out for the student's appropriate education. And you have to, that's the point that I'm making there. Okay, thank you. Next sure question. Thing. Are there others? Yes, there are. In Wyoming, we currently don't have virtual schools. We only have virtual education programs per our statutes. So we don't have LEAs and even students with disabilities have to meet eligibility criteria to enroll in a virtual program. I, I find that appropriate and functional, okay? If students, first of all, whether, whether you have LEAs that are virtual or not, that depends on the states. You've seen some examples that I've given you in other states where there are virtual LEAs, but there are other states like your own that don't have virtual LEAs. In fact, I don't think that in my state there's any virtual LEA. There's only schools that also have a virtual option, okay? Mm -hmm. And to, to participate in the virtual option, you have to meet certain admission criteria. I believe that is appropriate. It is not discriminatory to, to subject students to admission criteria that is intended to ensure that they can receive an appropriate education in the virtual program. That's not discriminatory. Okay. Here is a follow up on that comment then regular education students aren't able to join a virtual education program if they don't have reliable internet or if they don't have family designated learning coach as per our rules and regs. That's also not inappropriate. If you have an optional, optional virtual program and you'll see there's a case that we'll review in a little bit that talks about the parent's role. It's not inappropriate for a virtual program to essentially tell parents, if you want your child to participate in the virtual program, you have to agree to fulfill a certain role as part of the virtual program because you now are the eyes and ears of whether the student logs on, whether the student is, 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 is on task sufficient amount of time and whether the student's doing their work. Some programs call the parents learning coaches. You might give them different, different names. Um, so I totally agree. And, and it, there can also be a criteria that says you have to have a certain, certain amount, certain technology. You have to have uh, Wi-Fi abilities and you have to have the hardware. You have to have the computer. Otherwise, you can't participate. I don't think that's inappropriate. 
either for regular education students or special education students, as long as you're making a FAPE available at, 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 at school, okay? So about, about students with disabilities who the IEP team thinks a virtual program would be appropriate, if they didn't have the technology, what would you say? Um, if, if the student can be educated in a school setting, then my feeling is it is appropriate to tell the student the virtual program is not appropriate for you because you don't have the necessary technology. You will see in the cases later after we take a break that no hearing officer has ruled that schools have to provide a laptop and Wi-Fi for special education students to participate in a virtual program. No, no, Nobody has yet ruled that. I know that a lot of schools have voluntarily provided that, okay? But as long as you are making an option available in the school setting to receive an appropriate education, I don't think you have to give students laptops or Wi-Fi. You can if you choose, but, it, but if the question to me would be posed as an attorney, is there a legal requirement under IDA to do so? No, no. And um, if, during the uh, pandemic where there was no bricks and mortar option? Correct. Then? Correct, same answer. Hearing officers have not ruled that schools have an obligation under IDA to equip every student during the pandemic with a laptop. They're, they've said you can do other options, you can have hotspots, you can make people drive to certain locations. But if, if you imagine that would be immense in terms of resources in some school districts, it would mean spending uh, a lot of money on thousands of, of students to get laptops. So the, there's no court yet that has said that's an obligation of the school. A lot of schools have done it voluntarily, but it's not an obligation. It's, it's not a piece of technology that's gonna maximize the capabilities of the student. It wasn't necessary in the school setting. So I've had people tell me, well, isn't it a piece of assistive technology? No, not exactly. Um, but yeah, uh, even in the pandemic situation, the courts have not gone so far. Now an individual state as a state agency, you could take that position. If you feel that during the pandemic, students were forced to be at home and the schools should provide them laptops if they don't have one available. That's a decision the state can make, but I don't think it's an obligation under IDEA. So what if parents refuse what the IEP team recommends is the next question. If, if a, a parent says, I want my child in the virtual program and I'm refusing the recommendation of face-to-face -face instruction, like for example? Yes then the district has made an offer of fate. The parents' options are homeschooling, place the child in another district, place the child in a private school. A parent can't veto the decision made by an IEP team. It, the, probably, I mean, you guys don't encounter a lot of cases of disagreement, but at times you're gonna have that. If the parent wants something inappropriate, you're gonna to have to say no. Look, I'm a, I'm a special ed attorney for school districts. For 30 years, I've told school districts, if you can work out a situation, you wanna work it out, but there's a limit. And the limit is you can't agree to something that's inappropriate. You just can't mm -hmm. agree to something that compromises the child's education. So you're gonna to have to say no to the parent. And then the parent has the right to challenge it. The parent can file a a complaint with a state education agency or can file for a due process hearing or can file for mediation if they want to insist on the inappropriate option. But they can't force it. They can't force an IEP team to do what they want. That is not a right that parents have under IDA. I think we're good to go. Okay. Thank let's you. Move, let's move on. I'm going to, let me see. Um, I've noticed the Tacoma case is an example of the Washington case where you have a situation where the virtual program provided to the student is associated with the disciplinary action. 
And here, the district expelled a high schooler with ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. That, that double diagnosis is not uncommon due to a risk of violence. And after the expulsion term, the school said, we don't want you back in our schools. We want to move you to a virtual program that we run. And they did so without an IEPT meeting. And in the virtual program, the student did very little and was mostly off task. And the hearing officer said the virtual program's inappropriate for the student's needs. You have a student who's highly distractible and oppositional. They're not going to work well with a virtual program. In a virtual program, you need a student to be on task. You need a student to be able to work independently. You need a student who has some level of motivation, who's not going to be defiant, who's not going to be oppositional to the educational program. Moreover, the hearing officer pointed out the virtual program provides no social interaction. And it's true, you know, earlier when I talked about the different types of programs, I indicated there are some programs that are fully asynchronous and fully virtual. The student is only sees the screen, the lesson that the teacher has provided, the, the teacher may be asleep, no peers in sight. So that type of program provides zero social interaction, not even virtual interaction, whereas Zoom-based Zoom lectures, at least you're seeing your peers' faces. You can say hi to somebody. And you can actually hear them. So I, I actually think that there is a continuum of LRE within virtual programs, but here apparently it was fully virtual. Um, but I've also seen, notice the, the opposite result here. This federal court in Michigan granted an injunction where the school wanted to remove a large student who exhibited aggressive behavior and they wanted to put him in a virtual program. And the court said, well, you can move him to that virtual program. But the court did not comment on how the virtual program would be appropriate for a highly non-compliant student. How do you think? It's really not. Which brings me to the, the LRE issue. You know, what's LRE? What's least restrictive environment? Well, it's a, it's a clunky term because it's not self-explanatory or certainly not pretty well. Look at that first bullet point. LRE is all about to what degree is a special ed student educated alongside their non-disabled peers. And the less they're educated alongside their non-disabled peers, the more restrictive the program is, and the more they're, they're, being, they're learning with their non-disabled peers, the less restrictive the setting is. I would have called it less, least segregated environment. That makes most, more sense to me. And what the law says is you want the students in the least segregated environment possible, in the environment where they're least pulled away from their regular peers, okay? But the, the point that I'm making here is that the LRE requirement is based entirely on the model of traditional group instruction in brick and mortar school environments and physical exposure to peers, okay? And notice, notice that this is the case. Look at the, the main LRE regulation says, students should be placed in their brick and mortar campus they would attend if they were non-disabled, unless the IEP requires another arrangement, in which case they go to the campus closest other to their home, next closest, that does have the right types of services. So my question is, how do the LRE work in virtual settings? And up to now, Cases have applied the mandate rather traditionally, at least up until the time of COVID. And post-COVID, you're going to see that some courts have taken a, a rather novel approach to how LRE works in the virtual context. I mean, it's a red herring. It doesn't work, okay? Um, here's the case. It's uh, SPV Fairview School District. This, this case out of Pennsylvania, these, these parents in this school and the student ran this district ragged because the student claimed he had really severe migraines that made it impossible for him to go to school, go to school part time, audit classes, because all of these options were attempted. 
okay? And ultimately the school provided him a virtual program and he said, that's no good and he sued the school. The school had made numerous attempts to accommodate his condition. The student was missing school all the time, tardy all the time. So they told him, hey, what about you come in the mornings? What about you audit the afternoon classes? What about you show up when you can? What about you show up on the days you feel good and you catch up on the others? Nothing worked. The student would just not, not cooperate. Um, he had virtually been provided a hybrid program where he did some classes virtually and some classes at school, but apparently he, he never went to school and he didn't do any work on the virtual program either. The school fa finally um, provided a fully virtual program that the parents insisted on. The parents actually apparently researched and said, this is the virtual program that we want. School district probably in desperation were thinking, okay, we'll try it, okay? And so they put the kid on this virtual program and the student didn't perform. Okay, the student didn't participate in the program the parents liked, so the parents lost faith in the program which they themselves had insisted on. Ultimately, they sued the school. The parents got an expert and notice what the expert argued. The expert argued the virtual program is a highly restrictive placement because it pulls the student away from his non-disabled peers and it doesn't allow for learning of behavior and social interaction with peers. Both these points are true. I mean, the, a virtual program is certainly pulling the kid from regular peers in the physical sense. And if it's purely virtual in terms of learning modules, pulls them totally in a Zoom basis, you're still not physically with the kids, but at least you can hear them and talk to them. And I agree that, that when you have a student that has behavior problems or social skills problems, the virtual program is not for them because to learn social behaviors, you have to practice them with peers and hopefully in unstructured settings and structured settings. And the same thing with social interaction. You've got to practice it on your own and you have to work on it in a guided basis with actual instruction. But the court's position was, your migraines, they're so severe, you yourselves have said it, that it's in, the, the student is incapable of attending a regular program. So the school made extraordinary efforts to try to accommodate the student in a brick and mortar environment proper, prior to determining the most restrictive option was needed. And that's why I cited this case, because do you notice the court agrees that the virtual program is the most restrictive option akin to homebound placement or residential placement. In a homebound setting, you don't have exposure to anybody. In a residential placement, you might be out of town. You have exposure to other kids though. So they're along the lines there of homebound and residential in terms of the restrictiveness. If you look at virtual program from the traditional lenses of LRE, okay? And here's the new take, by the way. Okay, this is a recent case, Hernandez v. Grisham out of New Mexico. In this case was brought by special ed students because they were challenging a rule that limited in-person instruction in districts with high COVID numbers. As New Mexico reasonably said, in districts that have high positivity rates, which means there's a lot of community transmission, we're not gonna have in-person instruction. And the, the parents of these IDA students for reasons that I, I cannot decipher said, no, even though there's high positivity rates, we want in-person in instruction. And um, the court said, the rule does not violate constitutional considerations. First of all, it's necessary to protect public health and safety because you're not gonna convince the courts not to look at the, at the data you're just not gonna convince a court to do that. And the court also noted, where in the constitution does it say you have a right to in-person education? Okay, it doesn't say that. In fact, the constitution doesn't mention education much because it is a police power of the state under constitutional law, it's part of the police powers. And what that means is it's not the job of the federal government's education, it's, it's the job of the states, okay? so. They, the court said appropriately, there's nothing in the constitution that says you have a right to an in-person education. 
But that's not why I cited this case. Why I cited this case is, has to do with this slide. The parents claimed remote instruction violates LRE. They're making the argument of the parents in the, in the Fairview case. They're saying it's highly restrictive. And then notice the court's take. For the first time ever, the court takes the following position. The court said, since all the students have been relocated to the home, regular ed, special ed, 504, all students during a COVID closure have had to go home. That's now the mainstream setting. The home, that's where all students are getting their education. That's the regular classroom for purposes of the analysis. So the court takes a highly unusual position that the COVID closures actually change what the regular setting is. Is that what's happening? No. I mean, if I had the judge here, I'd say that's very creative, but I'm not sure, Your Honor, it's going to work. Respectfully, LRE is about the degree to which a student with a disability is exposed to non-disabled peers. And in a virtual setting, they are not physically exposed to non-disabled peers, and we can't avoid that. The reason that the LRE regulations and IDEA focus on removal from the regular classroom is simply that the regular classroom is where regular ed students are. So by removal from the regular classroom means you're removing the student away from regular ed kids, but putting a student in a virtual program inevitably is removing them from exposure to non-disabled peers and disabled peers, okay? So it's not a satisfactory position. Um, why is the court making taking a position that is kind of awkward, is kind of, I don't know, funky, okay, doesn't pass the fish smell test legally? Because LRE in the virtual environment, we're not, as a legal system under the IDEA legal framework, we don't know what to do with it. It's clear that it can't be that only students that have a need for something like residential placement are entitled to participate in a virtual program because that would be very, very few students. The reality is that virtual programs have now become part of the continuum of placements. We don't know exactly where they fit in terms of LRE. Are, are they the most restrictive setting as we look at it, you know, in a, in a normal sense? Or is it that electronic exposure and interaction through Zoom or uh, or electronically through email is, a, is, is kind of a form of social interaction that the courts must recognize. And that it's actually a form of social interaction in which more, more and more people are engaging in day to day. I mean, a lot of people nowadays, they interact uh, significantly through social media and electronically through text, email, et cetera. It's a new form of of social interaction that's becoming more prevalent in our lives, but the law hasn't caught up with it with respect to LRE. And so the does the traditional LRE analysis apply really in the virtual context? I'm not sure. Uh, maybe the answer is this, if parents choose a virtual program and they voluntarily say, I want the virtual program, is, is, is that sort of a waiver of LRE if they choose the, the virtual program, okay? Like a parent that wants private school, do they waive LRE if they want a private school for students with disabilities? Or must IEP teams limit admission to virtual programs to only the students that require the most restrictive environment? Because that traditional application would seem not to work because that would minimize the virtual program option for students with disabilities. And I do think it's a workable option for a lot of students with disabilities. And I think that more and more parents are gonna seek it out after the pandemic, as I indicated, because I think that some parents are going to like it. Or as I have proposed, does the virtual environment allow for some level of virtual interaction with peers? So is virtual LRE, virtual exposure to peers, should that become part of the LRE analysis going forward? And that is, that is really a question for the Congress. And that's really a question for whether the IDEA is going to adapt to acknowledge that um, physical interaction and virtual interaction, they, they're, they're all forms of social interaction. The law really has not addressed that issue yet. Because again, 
the IDEA is premised entirely on, on brick and mortars uh, type of placements. They never envisioned in 2004 that there'd be this proliferation of virtual placement. They never envisioned there was gonna be a pandemic that was gonna send everybody home. That was never part of the process. Okay, I'll move on. Away from LRE, which is an area where, God, things, just, things don't fit, I wanna to move to also other kind of appropriateness disputes that can involve virtual programs. Because at times, you know, there's a virtual program, but, you know, parents have a problem with it. Notice this Benson Unified School District case. Um, the parents of a student, the student had multiple chemical sensitivities. I don't know if you guys have ever encountered a student that can't be in a school setting because the, the cleaning products, the air quality is just not sufficiently good and it causes reactions. And I guess because of those problems, the school district had provided her homebound services. But what they were proposing now was changing those homebound services to a virtual program. And they did so because apparently the virtual program offered a much wider curriculum. And the parents disagreed. The parents wanted a teacher to come to the home. The parents said, the virtual program offers too little one-to-one -one instruction. They said, we are not gonna be able to serve as learning coaches and the student's gonna be exposed to print chemicals. I think the student was sensitive to the inks in paper. Um, moreover, the student psychologist said, she, she lacks the ability to self-motivate and to get work done on her own. Um, but the homebound teacher disagreed. Okay, the homebound teacher said, oh no, I think the student's very responsible and, and requiring her to do more work independently would be beneficial. So the hearing officer found for the school that the transition to a virtual program was available. Moreover, apparently the virtual program could be provided print free so the student would be exposed to no chemicals. And the school was even willing to send a paraprofessional to the home to serve the function of a learning coach to make sure the student logged on and off. The implications of that, well, are, are, are other schools really going to be willing to send a paraprofessional to the home just to ensure that the student logs on and stays and stays on task? It seemed like it would be a fairly one-on-one -on -one type of job, but a very significant resource just to have the child on virtual programming. This school district in Arizona was willing to do it. Okay. I don't know. Notice this case, this is interesting. Okay, so this Pittsburgh case, you have a teen with Asperger. Apparently it's a young lady, she uh, had Asperger's. I know we don't use that term anymore. It's all within autism spectrum disorder, maybe on the more uh, higher functioning side of things. But this young lady, uh, apparently she got into a fight with another young lady at school. I don't know if it was a full on physical fight or it was some sort of altercation, but that, that, uh, created a lot of anxiety on the part of the student and she had fear of school and she didn't want to go back to school. So the district proposed a mostly virtual program, um, but the parent disagreed. I mean, the parent said, no, 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 I, I want her to go to school, but you guys need to take care of this anxiety. And the court found that the student was not a good candidate for a virtual program, why? Well, because she was already obsessed with the computers and the internet. She was already spending too much time on the internet on the, and on the computer. And the court said, that's not good for this young lady. She's already spending time. On, so she's going to be during the school day, she's going to be on the computer and all hours that she's otherwise awake, she's going to be on the computer too. And the virtual program affords no opportunities for social interaction. That's, that's a, a smart point for the parent's attorney to have raised. You've got a student with Asperger's, her primary problem is likely to be social behavioral deficits. How can you improve your social skills in the context of being alone in front of the computer? That's no good for a student with Asperger's to improve and broaden their opportunities. They have to improve their social interaction and that can only happen around other kids, okay? So she needs other kids. So I agree with a hearing officer uh, in that case. Um, check out this, uh, this is another lawsuit against the Virtual Community School of Ohio. This, this, this school has suffered some claims. And these 
parents of a low functioning student with an intellectual disability due to Down syndrome, um, they, they challenged the virtual program that the virtual community school offered because it, they, they, she said it failed to provide an appropriate IEP or confer a FAPE and she wanted reimbursement for a private placement. She'd taken her child out of the virtual program, placed the child in a private program, and she wanted reimbursement. And apparently the parents had sought out the virtual program because they had had disputes with a previous brick and mortar school. And this virtual program, unsurprisingly, requires parents to play a very significant role. I said earlier in response to a question, for voluntary placements in virtual programs, I think it's entirely appropriate to tell the parents, you know, you're going to have to fulfill a significant role. And if you need a little training on it, we can train you on it, but you're, you have to ensure the student logs on, that they're on at appropriate period of time and that they're doing work. That's not surprising. Um, after some time here, the, the Virtual Community School of Ohio started having meetings and telling the parent, we think the student needs more intensive specialized instruction and hands-on assistance. He's not a good candidate for a virtual program. So they sought to move him to, to a regular school. The parents argued, no, it's that your staff aren't appropriately trained and it's that you haven't provided or maintained appropriate technology. And the parents stopped participating altogether and the students stopped completing any of the virtual program work. Uh, and the hearing officer actually found for the virtual program. Notice the quote of the hearing officer. When parents elect to enroll their children in a virtual school, they assume the responsibility of their new role as educational facilitator and eyes and ears for the teacher. Moreover, the hearing officer found all tech issues were addressed. So they, the hearing officer denied reimbursement, possibly on equitable grounds. Because if I was a hearing officer, I would have pointed out, you're the one that stopped participating. You're the one that refused to get your student to log on. And that's why he stopped doing any of the work. You, you weren't interested in the virtual program. You were interested in getting a private program. So the parent loses in this case. Um, I raise this as a discussion point, and it goes back to a question we had earlier. What, what should we do if a parent opts for at-home instruction, but despite the best efforts of the school, that virtual program is just not working for the student, okay? Um, for example, you have a parent, I've added this to the slide, you guys don't have this, but I wanted to raise this. You have a parent opting for remote learning, even though the school has reopened for live instruction, and the, but the student's not doing well remotely. Here's the first question I would have in response to this type of situation is, does the state allow parents to have the option? In some states such as mine, a parent simply can say, I want my child at home right now due to COVID, okay? If, if I'm concerned, I have the option to keep my child at school at home due to COVID. Um, but even in my state, if the child's not doing well, we have some rules to say if there's three unexcused absences in a grading period or the child's failing a class, the student can be removed from virtual and back to live instruction. Okay, so I think that what the IEP team should do in this type of situation is you've got to meet, you've got to review the kinds of things that you've tried to do to make the virtual program work, that you've come to the conclusion that the virtual program can't confer a FAPE. And if your state procedure is allowed to say, he's got to come back to school, okay? Our offer of FAPE is one of live instruction because we can't continue with a situation where the student's just not receiving an appropriate education. Like I said earlier, a parent cannot simply say, I, I want a program that can't provide my child an appropriate education. That's not an appropriate option. It's not, the parent doesn't have the right to force an inappropriate option, okay? Now, I think in the worst kinds of cases are cases where the child has a medical exception. They have asthma or they have a heart condition or immune condition, and they can't come to school because of, if, if they got infected with COVID, it could be fatal. And that's valid. So that student has to remain at home. But that same type of student is really not doing work virtually and the parents aren't helping. That's the worst possible of situations. 
there, you just have to try your best to get the student to work. But I do think in some cases, what the IEP team has to do is say, we're cutting off the virtual services and you're gonna have to return to face-to-face -face instruction because it's just not working. And the IEP team has to look out for the child's appropriate education, not just what the parent wants. That's the, that's the responsibility of the IEP team. At times that means a dispute. So be it, like I told you earlier, I'm all for reaching agreements with the parents, but there's a limit. And the limit is you can't agree to something that's inappropriate. You can't agree that the child's education just goes out the window. Check out this case out of Hawaii. We'll, we'll do this case and then we'll take a little break to stretch our legs. <clears throat> I was involved in this case. I helped out the attorney that was working in this case for the state of Hawaii. Very interesting case. He had a student with pretty significant cognitive impairments, but he also had hearing impairments and he also had medical issues and he also had behavior problems. So very difficult student, very challenging student to serve. And the district operated a charter school that offered a hybrid program. So part of the program was you have to come to this school, but the main portion of instruction took place virtually. Parents served as learning coaches, but they got some training and assistance on how to do it, which is not a bad idea, by the way, to provide some parent training in that. But quickly, problems developed in both parts of the program. The student pretty much wouldn't do anything on the virtual program, and the parent wouldn't make the student. In the school portion of the program, the student was either frequently absent or tardy. Um, for one, the child lived on one side of Oahu, Oahu is the most populated island. And if you've ever traveled to Honolulu, you know there's a lot of traffic. And the charter school was all the way on the other side of the island. And traffic being as it was, it was difficult. And the parent really had a dispute with her neighborhood school and she wanted him to go anywhere but that. So she was willing to drive him across the island. But he was getting there really late. At times he wouldn't wanna get out of the car. At times the staff would have to come out and help the student. And the, the program made lots of attempts to provide assistance and services to the child at home, very little results. Ultimately, the IEP team said, the student can't be served in this environment. He needs a structure and face-to-face -face services of a regular campus program in a structured special ed setting. He's got to go to a campus full time because he's not doing anything in the virtual program and he's not doing well in this hybrid going to school either. And the hearing officer found for the school, the hearing officer said, this student, the data indicates he needs a highly structured and consistent program. The virtual program can't work because his behaviors pose too great of a challenge for the parent. She just can't handle it. It's obviously she can't make him work. So the hearing officer said he needs a structured special ed placement on a regular campus. To so see this type of dispute here, the school district did the right thing and said, we can't continue with a program that's inappropriate, okay? This is typical option of a situation where the, the program has to take the student, but the student then is very difficult to serve on a virtual basis, things aren't working out. And then there has to be a retreat. The school has to say, we've got to go to a live instructional setting. But it's about, I have, let me see, for your time is 2.33. No, um, I'm confused as to yeah, the time, but anyway. It is 2.33. It is 2.33 for you. And if I, I'd like for us to take about a 15 to 15 minute break. What do you think, Ms. Shipley? Yeah, I think that would be fine. Okay, let's take a 15 minute break and let's regroup at 3.50. Yeah, I was going to say round it to 50. That sounds okay. good. Perfect. And I'll Thank see you, you soon. Okay. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, just another couple of housekeeping um, items. If you have a question and we encourage questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will address them um, right away. And also at the end of the session, you will have a link in the chat for PTSB and STARS credits and also the for the session evaluation. So we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And thank you back, Jose. I'll turn it over to you. Sure, I'm gonna finish up with a Hawaii case and then I'm gonna skip over to a section that I wanna go next. I wanted to point out a couple of things about 
this interesting Hawaii case. One is to go back to the question that was asked, if the virtual option is open to regular ed students, is it discriminatory to deny it to a special ed student? Notice here that this student is, is being denied part, continued participation in the, this hybrid program. But if you notice, why is it not discriminatory? Because he's, it's not working out there. Despite the best efforts of the Department of Education in Hawaii, he's not getting an appropriate education in the setting. So the hearing officer approves of the fact that no, he can't continue to go to the setting. A, a choice setting cannot, make, cannot deny the student appropriate education under IDEA. The FAPE under IDEA is sacrosanct. That's, that's the ultimate thing we're providing to students in special education. The other point that I wanted to make about cases of virtual programs is to raise this question. If you're gonna have a dispute over either whether a student should go into a virtual program or whether a student should be taken out of the virtual program, which do you think would be more common? And my experience has shown me that there's more disputes where once you've agreed to have the student in the virtual program and then you determine it's not working and wanna get them out, that seems to trigger more litigation which tends to tell me that it may be a better idea for IEP teams before the virtual placement is tried to really think, does the child have the type of competencies and skills? Does the child have the type of needs that mesh well with a virtual program? Ability to work independently, self-motivation, um, ability to stay on task for significant periods of time, no significant need for social skills instruction, no significant need for hands-on assistance. Yes, Ms. Shibley, do we have a question? Um, no, just it was just me. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate what you're saying. And I think it's important to emphasize here that um, if a student is admitted, documentation is, is so, so critical. Documentation of the student's access and performance progress monitoring, that has to be really key um, if you're going to determine that it's not being successful in this setting. I think that it's a given that if things aren't working out, the IEP team is meeting and you're trying to see what you can do to make it work. And that hopefully you've exhausted what you can try to do to make it work. But once that point is reached at which you think, that's it, we really can do nothing else, it's not working out. Then, then the discussion has to turn to, we need to, to move the student to a placement that will work. So it's, you know, obviously you're gonna try to make it work, but at a certain point you're gonna decide it doesn't. And the point that I'm raising here is, if, it, if it's in a future situation of a parent that wants to go to a virtual program and you know it's not the right student for that type of virtual program, I think it's probably a better idea to say no from the beginning and to explain to the parent how the child's needs and the inherent nature of the virtual program just don't work out, how, that, how that's not the best thing. I've had parents, they want a virtual program because they're sick of dealing with a truancy officer. As if moving the child to a virtual program will make the student now want to participate in education. And then, then they realize, oh, he's, he's not doing anything on the virtual program. Well, that's not a surprise. If you have a student who is resistant to attending class, he's going to be resistant to to being online, even more, even to a greater degree. So I think sometimes parents are, I, I'm not sure they're thinking right about what the virtual program can't and, and cannot offer. So that's, that's the point that I really, I really wanted to make there. Um, I have slides on how the programs need to be individualized to work and how you have to provide related services in the behavior, pro, in the, I'm sorry, in the virtual program but I wanted to move to, to slides that tell me what kinds of factors are relevant to whether a child's gonna be able to function in a virtual program and not, and I've listed them. I think once you have school attendance, school avoidance, work resistance, things aren't gonna work in the virtual program. You, you need a student who's able to remain on task with minimal prompts, who has kind of self-motivation 
kids that have significant social skills deficits, you're not going to be able to work on that effectively in a virtual program. Similarly, if you have students with more severe disabilities that require a lot of significant hands-on and hand-over-hand -hand instruction or life skills instruction, very difficult to do on a virtual basis. Ability to work independently, it's a must for students, okay? If they're not strong workers independently, it means they don't have, they either don't have the capacity they don't have the, or they don't have the motivation to do the virtual work. And that's, that's gonna be a big problem. A big problem. How have they done in previous virtual programs? Are the parents willing to play the role that's expected for them in getting the students to participate? You know, do, they, do the student have compliance problems or emotional problems? <clears throat> do they have the ability to work the technology with some training and support? These are the factors that I think are, are relevant. You know, because if you have it, here's the kind of cons of online programs. If the student's not motivated to participate, the teacher has limited options to keep the student on task. I mean, at a certain point after you're trying to remind the student to be on task, if they're out of the camera range or they turn their camera off, that, you know, that, that's kind of it. All you can do at that point is email the parent. Um, you, you, you need parental involvement and there's some situations where you might not have it. And I know that teachers have encountered this during the period of COVID closure because the student will say, well, my mom's at work and where's your dad? Well, my dad's at work too, you know, and you have the, the children are at home by themselves. So because of, of work and other obligations. Another thing is that online programs may be less reinforcing than live attendance. So it can create off test behaviors you know, uh, I have a, a nine-year-old grandson and he attended remote instruction for a significant period of time uh, here near Austin. And he explained to me one, because I asked him, what do you think about, you know, doing, doing your schoolwork at home? And he said, it's, it's not as good as you might think. And although he's not very communicative about those things, he got across to me the idea that he felt that all of the, the, the work obligations and burdens were there, but none of the perks of going to school that he enjoyed, which was the PE, the before school social time and the after school social time. And he said, that's all gone. So the, the cool stuff is kind of gone. And I just have the work. And even though he did well in class actually improved grade wise, but he wasn't enjoying it. And he's back to live instruction, enjoying it a whole lot more. The online programs sometimes are not as reinforcing, you know, as, as school attendance. And if a student is resistant, there's limited options that you can do to deal with that. There's limited behavioral intervention options. And then of course you have limited social interactions with peers. Um, I, I, I get, again, that's the point. And you know that, that the parents' role is in, increased in, in these types of programs. And I've explained that. By the way, as, as part of your materials, I included at the end of the text materials, my idea as to what an admission policy might look like for, let's say, uh, an optional virtual program. It has a mission and goal statement, an equity and access statement, and it says we want students to participate. You know, we're not, we're not going to categorically deny students with disabilities access to the virtual program, but at the same time, their access to the virtual program has to ensure that they receive an appropriate education. And if they can't receive an appropriate education, then they can't go there, okay? Because access, you know, FAPE comes before equity right to access. That's what's more important. And, and in, in these written policies, I have ideas as to what factors are relevant to, you know, what the program is going to work for the student, the type of factors that should be looked at in making an admission decision. It talks about parent roles. It talks about the possibility of needs assessment, you know, doing an assessment of whether the, 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 the need, the, the home environment and the parents' environment and the student's environment is, is in line with the possibility of providing appropriate virtual programming. It just kind of ideas that ensure that you have proper admission standards that the students that go to the virtual program are can receive an appropriate education there 
and that you don't take students on who are going to be deprived of an appropriate program and appropriate education if they go there. Okay. So I, and I think with students with disabilities, equal access to a program is if, if, if it confers you a FAPE in the same way that equal access to be being on the football team is if you're good enough, if you try out and you make the team, okay? So there's, there's certain uh, pre-considerations that come into to access as well. It's not just free and open. I wanted to turn to COVID cases by just reminding you that during the COVID period, the Department of Education said to the greatest extent possible, you've got to implement students' IEPs and 504 plans in, in the virtual setting. And there's complicating factors in deciding whether some students will need compensatory education when they get back or not. And one of the factors that I raised in this slide is, is, is the, the dilemma of parents that have failed to take advantage of services and, and how you deal with that. Do you provide compensatory services where the parents have just failed to take advantage of, of the services or not. And these are judgments that the state is gonna make, uh, is gonna have to make. Look at your guidance of your state education agency. I must say that federal courts to address the issue say, if parents haven't uh, availed themselves of services that were there, then they might not be able to get compensatory services later. You know, that's, that's the definite position of, of the federal courts. But I wanted to move to sharing some ideas is remember part of what I'm trying to address is is overcoming the problems that may be inherent in remote learning. And so I, I want to share some ideas to discuss for IEP teams dealing with students that are opting for remote learning. Okay. And the crucial initial question in my mind is, can the student realistically be provided an appropriate education in a virtual or remote program? I think that's, that's the primary question. Because all the equity access in the world doesn't matter if you're, if you're in a program that's not appropriate, okay? So if it's entirely appropriate under the law to deny admission to a virtual program, if we know you can't receive an appropriate education, in fact, I submit it's your duty under IDEA to say, no, you can't do that, okay? If the data indicates the student cannot realistically receive a FAPE in the remote setting, the IEP team should say so and consider offering live instructional program as the offer of FAPE and tell the parents, look, this is what we're offering you. Your offer of FAPE is a live instructional program because that's where we think you can get an appropriate education. If the states allow the parents to choose remote learning anyway, then develop a remote program as best you can. With the caveat, I think you should warn the parents it might not work. It might not yield appropriate progress. Your child's frequently on task and work resistant. He doesn't have a lot of motivation for independent work. This is the type of student that tends not to do well in this program. But if under your state rules, you have to allow that. You have to allow that placement, which in some states you're gonna make, maybe need to. Okay, depending on, on the guidance from your Department of Education, you have to tell the parents that. And I think it might be a good idea to tell the parents, here's what we would offer you at school. And that's what we recommend. Yes, Ms. Shibley. There is a question. Is this still true for a virtual program that are strictly virtual? Yes. Yes, this, this is true for all of these variations of programs, with programs that are strictly virtual, with programs that are remote, beamed into, you know, there's live instruction, but it's beamed into the, the student's computer, or Zoom instructional lessons. I, I put that all sort of under the rubric of virtual slash remote. Point being that some students' needs are just such that that type of setting will not work for them, okay? Yes. And I want everybody to understand it's not discriminatory. No more discriminatory than removing a student from the regular class to put them in a special ed classroom. All students have the right to be in the regular class. Why? 
not if it can't meet your needs. And you know that for some special ed students that can't meet their needs. And it's not seen as a denial of the regular classroom. It's seen as the provision of, of an appropriate education through specialized instruction, okay? So the initial question is, can we provide a FAPE? And then, then it breaks down, okay? On the, in the virtual or remote setting, can we realistically provide you your IEP services and specifically the meat? You know, as I see IEPs, it's like a hamburger. And to me, a good hamburger has all the components. But the meat of the hamburger, the protein, is definitely the special education services. That's, in fact, what makes the child special ed is the need for special education services. You have, you have a disability that qualifies and you need special education services. So the team has to figure out how do we duplicate the special education services in a virtual format. And I'll, as you'll see from the cases that I will go into next, the hearing officers in the courts tend to take a pretty straightforward and simplistic approach. They wanna see the same amounts of time and frequency of services of special ed services as in the live IEP. If the child got 60 minutes of special ed instruction for math, they're gonna to wanna to see 60 minutes of virtual instruction for math. That's just their tendency. That's just how they see it, okay? If you're providing inclusion assistance, that's the special ed service that the child is getting within the context of the regular classroom. You have to think of options for providing the inclusion assistance vir virtually. You know, how will you get the special ed teacher to provide assistance to the student virtually? Do you do it um, during the classroom? Do you communicate with the student, you know, by Zoom? Do you do it afterwards? You have to figure out a way that that inclusion assistance, which is the addition of the special ed instruction that will enable the student to, to participate and progress in regular classes gets implemented. So you have to think of that. Um, remember this, as you guys are opening for live instruction, the, you have an option for kids that are still remote to basically do true remote, which is camming into the actual live classroom with two-way audio and video, like I indicated before. So the classroom is going on normally. But the, a student or certain students are watching remotely from their homes and they can hear what's going on in the classroom and they can participate. And I gotta tell you that I like that option. I, I think it's the closest to participating in the live classroom environment if you're gonna go remote because it addresses any concerns over equality of instructional time. It's like, it's the, it's the same amount of time for everybody. I mean, it's a class period. It's full school day and proper, proper probably it's preferable from a social standpoint because you're hearing the kids, you're engaging in the classroom discussion. I happen to think it's less restrictive than the pure, pure virtual, okay? Because you're, you can participate in the classroom discussion on a live basis, auditorily, you, can, you know, verbally. Whereas in a, in, a, in a virtual setting, if there's class participation, it's happening just through chat questions and answers, for example, okay? So think about it, think about it. I was disappointed to find that one of my clients, they've reopened for live instruction, but a number of their kids are remote. So guess, guess what's happening in the classroom, in the live classroom? All the kids are on the computer and the teacher is just basically doing Zoom-based lessons to the kids that are at home and the kids that are in the classroom so that the, the, the Zoom instruction has taken over the live instructional environment. Of course, my question is, why aren't you just doing live classroom with the kids there and, and having the camera just for the kids that are remote? Seem to me, seems to me a, a better option, okay? Remember, ultimately, the amount of virtual special ed instruction that you provide has to be sufficient to provide the gas to meet those IEP goals, as well as with the live services. That's, that's the real deal. And remember that I see the, the, the amount of services that you provide as to whether they're sufficient to enable the IEP to 
meet those goals. And that's what you want. You want to meet those goals at the end of, of that calendar year. Maybe not all, but you want to meet most of those goals. That's what shows appropriate progress. And I think you have to realize that you're going to, you're going to find that some students may actually require more special ed instruction in the virtual setting than they did in the live instructional setting, just due to the differences in the model. Vir virtual and remote instruction is very different than the live setting. You guys are experiencing that right now as I have. For me as a speaker, speaking on a, on a Zoom basis is a very different experience than speaking on in, in, with a live audience. The experience is different. And I'm also a consumer of continuing legal education and doing legal education on a virtual basis rather than going to a conference is a very different experience. You guys know it, you guys know it. So you shouldn't be surprised that, that my point is that the virtual environment as an educational setting is vastly different than, than the live educational environment. Next, you gotta think, how are we gonna do this? The related services, okay? What are related services? Related services are those services that the child needs in order to benefit from the special ed services. If you go to the, back to the hamburger analogy, for me, a good burger's gotta have the veggies. You know, you gotta have the lettuce, the tomato. I like onion and pickles, you know? And to me, those are the related services that enable the whole burger to taste really, really good. And technically, literally in the law, the related services are those that the child needs in order to benefit from their special ed. Um, but I think that the beauty is that most related services can be provided on a teletherapy basis. They can be provided through the computer, speech. I was surprised to find at the outset of the pandemic that OT and PT, something that I consider to be very hands-on, that they said, oh no, they, it can be done on a teletherapy basis quite appropriately, counseling, I think can be done on a teletherapy basis. Actually, most related services can be provided on a teletherapy basis. And again, the hearing officers are gonna expect the amounts and frequency to be the same. If you had group speech, you can do group teletherapy speech. One-on-one -on -one counseling, do one-on-one -on -one counseling. I will do a proviso, I have found that most of the licensing organizations and boards appear to want a therapist and providers to get an additional parental consent to providing the therapy on a teletherapy basis, okay? And, and, and I think that's appropriate. Usually I want to ensure that, that folks that are therapists within the school setting, that, that we are observant of their responsibilities to their licensures and they don't get in trouble with that. So if, if they need to get an additional consent, I, if I was a school person, I would facilitate that. And, and in fact, I've, I've drafted some, some of those consents. Um, uh, some kids may require a new related service and that's parent training. Because if you might find that a parent needs training on how to log on for their, let's say five-year-old, because he can't log on on his own, uh, and, and, and how to work the program. And, and maybe some training on strategies to keep your kid on, on task and motivated. You know, I think a very, very helpful lesson for parents that the COVID pandemic has provided is a firsthand view of how difficult it is to be a teacher because parents have had to assume a little bit more of that role during, during COVID and now they're realizing just how, how challenging it is to keep your child on task, keep them motivated. And, and I think also it's, it's about helping parents understand you need a, a, a private quiet learning space at home. That's gonna facilitate the best thing. I think the best thing is to keep it real routine. You want, you want a place where your child gets their education and you wanna keep that as routine as possible so that the child has a school day in the sense at home. And then you have to think, how do we provide the student their accommodations that they need in regular classes? And I think that here the trick is review the accommodations that are provided in the live instructional setting and see if they apply in the virtual setting. Some will naturally. 
I mean, extra time for assignments, you know, that's, that's, that can be done virtually just as easily as in the classroom. Shortened assignments, that can be done just as easily. But some might need to be redesigned a little bit to fit in the virtual setting. Like in the classroom, I'd say borrow a peer's notes for note-taking assistance. Well, I might have to change to you have to provide a copy of the teacher's notes or you arrange electronically for a peer to send the notes. Reteach difficult concepts, which might happen in a brief little one-on-one -on -one during the classroom setting may have to change to something else. Maybe you point the child to helpful on online resources to help with the assignment. So you have to think because some of those accommodations are, are very uniquely tied to the classroom environment and, and might not work in, in, the, in the virtual environment in the same way. So you have to kind of translate it into the virtual environment. And same thing for behavioral interventions. And when, when do you have to put behavioral interventions in an IEP? I think the standard trigger is if a student exhibits recurring behavior that impedes their learning or that of others, you, you're going to have to consider positive behavioral intervention supports and strategies. So says the regulation that I've cited right here. And, and you have to understand that some students might engage in different behaviors in the virtual setting than in the classroom. You know, I, I can understand that. I mean, some kids are just, you know, they just are sick of it. And it's not as reinforcing as being in the classroom and the behavior plan might have to change to reflect that. You know, the child that wasn't so much off task in the live classroom environment suddenly is, is more off task in the virtual setting. And, and, and you have to reflect that because the behavior supports that you have to provide or whatever it's necessary in the current educational environment to facilitate the student participating and, and progressing. Thus, so I have some slides on discipline in the virtual setting, but I'm just gonna cover this briefly. I do wanna emphasize that the IDEA rules of discipline apply equally during virtual instruction. There's been no waiver of the discipline rules during COVID uh, or, or in virtual instruction, okay? Um, the Secretary of Education had an opportunity a month after the stimulus bill was passed to ask Congress for waivers or flexibility in implementing IDA, but she asked for almost none because she said uh, FAPE could be provided through access uh, to at-home services through virtual programs. So this would seem to indicate that the discipline regulations are, are fully in force in, in virtual programs. So, but a, a disciplinary removal looks a little different. If you, I think it's if you remove or exclude the student from virtual or online services, that's sort of like a suspension. So if you exclude the student from the, the virtual or online program for three days, I think it should be interpreted as equal to three days of at-home suspension. And remember, you have a limit of 10 safe removal days per school year and it would apply to virtual removals as well, okay? I think suspension is available in the virtual context. If you guys think that's valuable, if there's been a serious disruption to the online educational environment, do so. I've seen some schools and they're considering additional code of conduct provisions that are applicable in that unique context of the online educational environment, you know? Because we've seen kids engage in some of those, those behaviors. Obviously, if, if you exclude a student with disabilities long term from the virtual program, you know, just kind of you're suspended. It's not come back to school. It's just you, you're going to take a time out and it's longer than 10 consecutive days. Then you're going to need to do a manifestation determination and you're going to need to have a meeting. And to accomplish that lengthy removal, you're going to have to find, have a finding the behavior is not related. Okay, um, students might start displaying inappropriate behaviors for the first time in the virtual setting, that that can happen. I think that the virtual setting has generated new stresses for students and have generated new behaviors. It, the, the difficulty I think is that you kind of have to develop virtual interventions and apply them in a virtual way with electronic strategies, but you can do positive reinforcers. There can be, Electronic referrals. I've got a school where teachers fill out a disciplinary referral and you have to electronically have a Zoom meeting with the assistant principal. 
to talk about your disciplinary referral. So it's like it's like going to the, to the principal's office. Consequences can be a little bit more difficult. It could be loss of privileges. It could be definitely emails to the parents to discuss your misbehavior. It could be demerits. It could be silencing of the microphone if you've been disruptive. Um, I've been asked, does, does the code of conduct apply equally in the home setting? <clears throat> not, not quite. I think that behaviors that are disruptive, uh, yes. Um, and we've seen all kinds of different types of things. But, you know, there are certain behaviors like having an inappropriate item appear in the background of the screen. It's not the same as a student possessing it at school. And I don't know if you heard that I believe in, in Georgia, a student had a BB gun and it was in the background. It was just in, in, in view behind him as he was in the Zoom class. And it was treated as if he had a BB gun at school. Should it have been? I don't think so. Does he have a BB gun at school? No, okay. I mean, is the student creating any danger by having that BB gun in his room? Not to the school environment. So I, I just don't see it in the same line in, as, as the student having a BB gun at school. It's totally differently. So I think it's gonna have to be different, but boards might wanna consider adding virtual behaviors. <clears throat> what kinds of things? misuse of the platform, like hacking into it. I've had teachers report that students suddenly shared inappropriate material on the platform, um, left the screen during instruction, leaving the camera during instruction, disrupting instruction electronically. And I think there can be dress expectations virtually. You know, I, I think that all of, all of that can, can can take place. I mean, you, you definitely want kids to participate virtually in a way that they're not impinging on other students' education, okay? Um, but it can be a little different in the virtual setting. How about parent behavior? Well, I think it's about setting forth some common sense ground rules, making sure there's a private area for instruction, avoiding interruptions. You know, that's, that's kind of necessary. Um, I mean, you'd, you'd love it if the parents will assist in logging on in a timely fashion. Refraining, if possible, from having family members viewing. I don't think that's necessarily a violation of FERPA, but you'd like to avoid it simply because it's distracting to others and to the student themselves. You don't want a parent communicating with the teacher during the lesson. You know, if you need to communicate with the teacher and you're a parent, you set up a parent-teacher conference virtually. Um, and, and just basically, you want the parent to assist in ensuring that the student is properly behaving and participating during lessons, which, you know, it's, I think it's a reasonable expectation. I think it's just that during the COVID period, a lot of parents are under more stress. If serious misbehavior, well, the student's already kind of in an interim alternative education setting. So I don't know if, if you have to do a removal to an interim alternative education setting that might have to wait until the student uh, returns to live instruction unless you create a virtual disciplinary alternative program, which I suppose could happen. Um, any questions on the discipline piece before I move to COVID related cases? Or any questions on anything? Doesn't appear to be in the in the Q and A anyway. All right, I'll continue and feel free to ask, guys. It's totally okay. Okay, let's talk about some COVID related cases. The reason that I'm going over COVID cases is I think they provide good lessons on what was and is expected in virtual learning to comply with IDA, whether it's during the COVID period or the kind of post-COVID period, hopefully the post-COVID period. And I really want to hear that. I really want to hear the word post-COVID, okay? That, that's going to make me really happy. These cases will show us how COVID comp services will work. Remember, if if kids have experienced learning loss or they missed out on services during school closures, you may owe them some compensatory services as the Department of Education. I like to call it COVID comp because it's not necessarily a fault of the district, 
that you had to close. Um, some of the cases help us understand how procedures were expected to work in terms of when we closed and moved students to virtual and then be as they're returning. The open question that's going to remain is whether these situations will be analyzed differently for parents that insist on virtual learning, even if the school has opened. And I really think that that's going to happen. I really think that once this is all over, some parents are going to prefer the remote learning option for their children. That was already happening, as I said, before the pandemic, and I think it's going to increase now. And, and if, if you want virtual learning and you're the one that voluntarily wants that, is, is the expectation and the services requirements gonna be, be viewed the same as if it was forced on you, which I see as a different situation. Uh, overall, I see the hearing officers in the courts, as I indicated, as seeming to demand that the schools provide about the same frequency and amount of IEP services that they did um, <clears throat> during online periods as in the school environment, okay? The schools that have done very abbreviated virtual services during the period of closure have not fared well in litigation. The other point is when you have a student that's refusing or resistant to participate online, you have to demonstrate all your efforts to get these kids to participate, all your contacts with the parents, IEP meetings, trying to figure out what the problem is, trying to address the problem. And you have to have had a willingness and continue to have a willingness to meet, to adjust the IEP, to address students that are, are struggling during online periods or during virtual, virtual periods of instruction. I think that in terms of the comp services, that it's, it's fair to tell parents, we'll address the comp services when the child returns to face-to-face -face instruction. Although you'll see that some hearing officers have granted comp services even before the school is reopened. And I think schools should start thinking, what kind of a process, what kind of a protocol are we gonna have in place for considering whether a child needs COVID-related comp services? What, what data points and pieces are we gonna look at Certainly think the progress during COVID compared to the progress before COVID. And then how is the student done upon return to school? And what process are you going to use to gather that data and present it in an IEP team meeting? I do think it's an IEP team decision. Okay. Now, I don't think that a speech therapist on her own gets to decide whether COVID is needed, COVID comp is needed, and how much. I think that's an IEP team decision. It has to be. Ultimately, it's a faith-based decision, and the IEP team is the boss of, of faith. Okay, so let's talk about some cases. <clears throat> Initially, this case came out and scared me a little bit because um, <clears throat> it seemed to impose some, what I felt were unrealistic obligations on schools during the period of closure. And this is LVB, New York City. New York City is one of the school districts in the United States that gets hit the, with the most kinds of lawsuits. And apparently the parent in the school district had already had a due process hearing that culminated in a September 2019 hearing officer's order. And that hearing officer's order said, this five-year-old with autism has to be provided in-person ABA services, OT, PT, and a dedicated aid. COVID hits. And you're in COVID, the school provided the student a tablet device. You know, I indicated earlier, I don't think it's a legal obligation of a school to provide like computer devices to students just because they don't have them during COVID closures, but this, this district did. They provided the student a tablet device, but apparently the student didn't have the capacity on task to sit down long enough to use it. And then uh, the, the student was provided computer-based, web-based services, but the home didn't have reliable Wi-Fi. So it, in some, the student really wasn't, you know, able to avail themselves. And notice what the court said. The court said the district hasn't adequately explained how its virtual services are a satisfactory, satisfactory substitute, uh, nor conducted an evaluation of how remote services can be delivered to the child to meet his needs. 
evaluation. How are we going to do an evaluation in the midst of a pandemic that's just breaking? Is it realistic that for every child that we're moving to the home setting in March of 2020, we're going to do a prior evaluation before making that determination? I, I'm sorry, this federal judge, he's, he's, we're not in touch with the same reality here. The court said there is a failure to take the student's unique circumstances into account in offering the services. That, that basically the school offered the same thing as they offered to thousands of students. Now that's more on point. That I more agree with. In, you can't discharge your obligations by just saying, you know, here's here's a you know here's a laptop, and we're just going to give you some web-based services like for everybody else, even though you're five-year-old. Uh, and you have significant autism and you're significantly on task. I mean, what effort to individualize the services for this young man was made? And the answer is apparently none. So the court orders in-person services to the extent they can be performed safely. Well, I mean, if this was this decision was issued right in the midst of the pandemic. And you know what the situation was like in New York. It was dire. Okay. So I, the court is ordering in-person services. Who knows if they can happen? And, and the court said, um, oh, I want an, an AT evaluation because you guys didn't do an AT evaluation. I mean, I, well, how, is that really the fault of the district? How does one conduct an AT evaluation if in-person assessments and observations can't be safely done? It's not feasible to do. Again, I'm just, I just think we're out of touch with the reality here, this, this, this court does. So they tell the parent, you pick the private providers willing to provide in-person services in case district staff aren't willing. They're not going to be willing. It's not safe to provide in-person services. You can't make a five-year-old with autism wear a mask. And you're, and you're going to go into a home environment, you know, with strangers. I mean, that's just not feasible safely. It, it violates every CDC rule out there. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the court finds against the parent. But what, what kind of struck me about this this very early COVID case was, it's not responsive to the realities on the ground. This idea that you have to evaluate and, and hold some sort of report-based evaluation to see how you provide services virtually. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Now an IEP team meeting and figure out for this five-year-old with autism, okay, we're gonna have to adapt the program and we're gonna have to provide some Zoom thing that's very specialized that's in short lessons with parent assistance. There needed to be more thought here. And unfortunately, I think New York was working in volume and, and wasn't able to accomplish that, okay? Uh, I moved to District of Columbia and, and this is a student and he's in special ed due to another health impairment and he missed some OT and some special ed service during the COVID closure. And the hearing officer found the school made the services available, but the student didn't have a computer um, or, or a hotspot that he could access. Um, and and the, the parent basically was pressing, well, the school has an obligation to provide a computer. And the hearing officer said, show me a case I and mean, show, show me something that says we have to. And the, the, the court concluded, I, I just have no authority that indicates the school has an obligation to provide stu a student with a laptop or Wi-Fi just in order to access virtual services during the pandemic. And like I indicated to a previous question, I think a lot of school districts did this voluntarily, but a legal obligation for every student in the United States to be provided a laptop for use at home. By the way, a little aside from this, I'm finding that my school districts that were kind and, and provided laptops to parents during the period of COVID closure, um, then at the start of the school year, um, the, the parents told the school, oh, well, we moved to another school district and so forth, and the laptop is gone. And is there really a viable way for the school to sue the parent to recover that laptop? I mean, they asked me and I told them, not really, not really. I mean, the, the cost of even finding the parent, serving them with process, suing them to get the laptop, I mean, call them and try to get it back. But is there a real, you know, viable 
and practical legal mechanism to get that laptop back, you're never going to get it back. I'm sorry, that's, that's just not going to happen. Okay. Um, the hearing officer ultimately in this case said, well, the OT services that were missed were consultative only, and overall the student didn't make progress, so they didn't find a denial of faith. And, and here's more on the laptops. I note that although many school districts decided to provide laptops to students that didn't have one, no court or hearing officer has up to now ruled that LEAs have a legal obligation to provide this laptop. There's another District of Columbia case, and again, a hearing officer said, I'm not going to order a laptop. Um, is it an assistive technology device? Remember, those are, are devices that increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of the child. For a child to need it at home, they would have had to have needed it at, at school before. And, it, you know, it, 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 that AT need doesn't necessarily change uh, when the child goes into, into the virtual setting. They might need a little training on how to use the computer, perhaps, that they haven't used before. But the, the laptop, the provision of the laptop, that appears to be something that schools should investigate if they can, if they have the resources, but it's, it's not a legal obligation. Okay, the Lenape case out of New Jersey, um, this, this parent had a student with very medically fragile type of conditions that apparently required a one-on-one -on -one full time nurse at school. And, and then, then they, it went virtual. <clears throat> and the parents said, I want a nurse at home during the day provided by the school during the school hours. And it was an 18 year old student with a big seizure disorder and diabetes. They were provided a nurse to monitor seizures and glucose levels. And the hearing officer, I think, and this is a straightforward proposition, said the nurse was for school. The nurse isn't required to access learning. The nurse is just required to maintain health and safety at school so that the student can remain at school. But that need kind of goes away when the child is in the home setting. And I agree with the hearing officer. At that point, I think it's the responsibility of Medicaid or insurance companies to provide the home-based nursing services that would have to be provided in fact, the case does not indicate why the parent would not have been able to access public assistance for the health services in the home, okay? Um, because apparently she, uh, she had, a, she had a, a nurse during some periods of the day. The sad part here is the parent said, I need the nurse during the day so I can sleep during the day and take care of his medical needs at night, which, you know, heartbreaking. And that parents would be faced with a circumstance where I, I can't, you know, be awake during the whole day and they take care of his medical needs at night. But again, the big question is, why, why couldn't you have a nurse during the day provided through Medicaid um, if you're eligible or insurance and, and so that you can take care of the medical needs at night? And it may have been a situation where for some reason the public assistance just wasn't available. That's a sad situation, but the hearing officer said it's not the responsibility of the school district. The school district is not the medical provider of last resort. That's, that's not the situation. Um, so the hearing officer denied relief in this case. I, have, I, I won't cite to state educational agency complaints, except that a couple did catch my eye that I wanted to share with you. And this one is out of South Dakota, Brookings. And this, this student is a high schooler and the parents essentially were contesting the fact that they sent the student home for COVID. You know that there's some folks out in the community that resist the notion that the school closures were necessary at all. And I think these parents took that position and they alleged that there was a failure to provide the IEP during the school closure. Well, the state education agency investigates and the district had developed a special education distance learning plan. The parents had rejected it. They said, no, we want in-person services. Either you let our child go to school or you bring in a provider into the home, neither of which was obviously feasible. And the state education agency is not gonna order that in a million years, okay? 
So apparently instruction was provided through a Read 180 software. They provided the student a laptop, which they didn't need to. They provided accommodations, a headset. Special ed was provided through Zoom and video lessons. And the staff were in constant communication with the parents. Some of the speech therapy wasn't provided. Some of the special ed services weren't provided. But the, the state education agency noted that the student appeared to make good progress on, on his IEP goals. And um, the parents insisted we've had to help the student a, a whole lot, hours every day. Um, but the state education agency said, we, we agree that in-person services aren't possible because that's based on governor's orders. And again, I think it's these parents that are just in denial and just saying that's not necessary. And no state education agency is gonna force a school district to endanger their staff or endanger the family. And um, they also find the move to at-home services wasn't a change in placement. They don't explain why. And ultimately they say, the discrepancies for, from the IEP were minor and didn't impede the student from making progress. So we're gonna order no relief. Here's what caught my eye about this case. The state education agency, when they heard the parents say, we provided all of this assistance to the child at home, they said, we're not gonna, we're not going to consider that because there wasn't any documentation of such efforts. And in my head, the immediate question I asked myself, what if the parents had kept daily logs of the amount of time they had to help the student at home and had provided that documentation? You know, in SEA complaints, documentation is everything. What if the parents had had documentation? Is that a valid factor in determining whether the services at home that the district is providing are adequate? If the parent had to provide a lot of assistance, it may be that the services weren't really adequate, even though the student was progressing. And there's a case there. Okay, Brianne uh, from Pennsylvania, the court took into consideration documented evidence that the parents were spending up to three hours a day helping this young lady with her work and that that was masking her academic deficits and that she, in fact, was more behind than it, appe than it appeared. Okay. But I think in some cases, if parents keep close evidence of the assistance that's provided in the home, it can be something that is, that's, uh, that's addressed. Um, normally, the point I make in this slide is when we have cases and they've addressed voluntary placements and virtual programs, they have assumed that parents are expected to play an enhanced role in ensuring that the student participates. The question I follow up with is, is this expectation reasonable, meaning that the parents have to help in situations of non-voluntary moves to virtual instruction, like when you close the schools, okay? The parents are like, I don't want virtual instruction, I just have to have it. Is it feasible that you demand that the parents provide you assistance in situations where you force virtual instruction on them? I don't think so, I don't think so. I think you can ask, I think you can hope, but demand, not quite so sure, okay? Um, in the Wayne Township case out in New Jersey, there's an eighth grader with autism. I think kids with autism, are, we're gonna find had, had a, a harder time uh, during the school closure. I mean, I've had some that academically did well, but upon return to school, what we're finding is significant behavioral and social regression. And that's, that's becoming an impediment as they're coming back. And others struggled mightily during the COVID closure because it wasn't structured enough, the virtual services. So here, the parents uh, challenged the school's virtual instruction plan and they put them in an out of, out of district full-time virtual program. It had to be. I mean, private programs went virtual as well. And the hearing officer denied that because the parents were unable to show irreparable harm. But notice the facts of the case. The district's virtual instruction program was offering only two hours a day of instruction, okay? And you went from seven hours of instruction to two hours a day of instruction. How's that gonna fare, okay? And then the parent said, and he's not able, any, even able to access that due to his disability. He's too off task. You need something a lot more structured. Is there evidence that the abbreviated instruction provided sufficient structured programming 
for progress? Probably not. But remember here, the parent was asking for emergency relief, and that's really hard to get. I think if the parent had just filed a regular due process hearing, the parent would have likely won. Because generally, where districts crunch the seven hour school day of instruction into a couple of hours, things aren't going to work. I was flabbergasted that when my grandson, nine years old, fourth grader, um, not finishing the third grade, finishing the third grade in April and May of 2020, my daughter was telling me they're hardly providing me any virtual instruction. Now he's not special ed, he's just regular ed, okay? But they still went on a virtual program and I told her, time it. I want you to time the time of virtual instruction. She timed it and over average in April and May, it came to 19 minutes a day. So the seven hour school day was compressed into 19 minutes a day. What did that mean? She was doing most of the instruction. Now, it was a lot better as the school year started, but right as they were putting the virtual program together, they were providing measly amounts of instruction. And my daughter and my grandson struggled, okay? Now, some districts, the problem wasn't so much the, the, what they provided initially in the virtual program, but that when the students started struggling, they didn't fix it. And... Uh, there's another District of Columbia case. I got lots of cases, okay? The IEP team in April, just as this thing hit, had agreed that some behavior support services needed to be added to the IEP of, of a student that had LDs and ADHD. What a common combination, right? I mean, those are cousin disabilities. ADHD is a close cousin to LD, and, and they come over a lot. And uh, they weren't added to the IEP until June the behavior support services and the behavior intervention plan. And meanwhile, the student had loads of problems because he needed the behavior support services even in the live setting. Then he goes virtual. He doesn't get the behavior support services for April, uh, May, and, and on until June, so two to three months. And he missed loads of assignments and he had lots of problems self-initiating and getting on the website and doing the work. And the hearing officer said, it, you delayed in incorporating the behavior services and that amounted to a denial of FAPE. At least those two months you messed up and he, the hearing officer ordered independent tutoring notice 150 hours and 20 hours of compensatory counseling. So when there's failures, what the hearing officers generally will find is you lose and here's the compensatory services you have to provide. And if you violate the orders of the hearing officer, you're going to get in trouble you're gonna get the district in significant trouble. Um, notice this case, this is, this is a sad case. I mean, anybody can spot from a mile away that the district is gonna lose in a situation. This is Norris School District. You have a seven-year-old with autism and speech language impairments and all that's provided for him during the period of closure is packets, packets of materials for a seven-year-old with autism. And then we check in with the parents. Of course, the student's not participating in the packets and there's no attempts at direct instruction, no, no attempts at Zoom instruction. Staff just said, oh, he's just not gonna like those things. So for about two months, no services, no benefit, no nothing is going on. You take a child with autism off the structure of learning on a daily basis and, and it, you're gonna regress pretty substantially. And the hearing officer said, the LEA has messed up here. You should have collaborated with the parents, find ways, some way to provide direct instruction. I mean, you're going virtual, but sending packets home is simply unlikely to be sufficient for a child with significant disabilities. And you don't even hold an IEP team meeting. You pay 40 hours of compensatory speech, 77 hours of tutoring, 49 hours of behavior services by providers chosen by the parents. Ouch plus the FAPE services that the child is entitled to normally. Compensatory services can be difficult to provide, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip the point on PWN, on private, uh, private notice. The only points I wanted to make in that slide is that some hearing officers said, as the students move from live face-to-face -face instruction to virtual instruction due to COVID, you have to do prior written notice. And other hearing officers said, no, you don't have to do prior written notice because this applied to everybody. So you know how clear it is? It's clear as mud, okay? 
So it was priority notice required or not, who knows? I think you should have done priority notice both to get the students into home instruction and then, and then to move them back. I think the safest way is to consider those to be changes in placement, which you either do through meetings or IEP amendments, and you provide priority notice both there and back, both to home and back, okay? Um, in the East Windsor case, another situation of just not fixing a, a, a broken situation, another student with autism. You see a pattern here? Um, he's a fifth grader and he's provided limited direct instruction during the COVID closure because he resists learning and he hates non-preferred activities. That's always a challenge with students with autism. They like their preferred activities, but then getting them to do a non-preferred activities, yikes, you're gonna have to time, set a timer, warn them, give them prompts visually, have a visual transition plan to move them. You have to think of all those things. And the parent and the school were arguing about what, you know, what to do for the student because it was challenging because he was resistant, but the IEP team didn't meet. They only kind of talked with the parents. So that, that's, that's gonna kill you there. The hearing officer said, notice that after you did have an IEP meeting in June and you put together strategies, things improved. Well, you know what that means? If you'd met earlier in the spring, it might've made a difference. School, you lose, you should have acted faster. Remember, go back to what I told you earlier. Um, special ed law is, if there's a problem, do something. Okay, here there was a problem and they kind of just watched it and talked instead of having a meeting and doing something, okay. Curiously, the hearing officer said, I'm not gonna award comp. Um, I'm gonna have the IEP team determine if comp is necessary uh, later on. I also note that this team expected the parent to provide lots of assistance, hands-on, one-on-one, in the home during lessons, even though she had other kids to care for. Is that, is that reasonable? When it's not a voluntary virtual placement, is the virtual placement forced on the parents? To what extent can schools expect parents to assist with remote learning during a closure? Expect, no. Hope, okay. Ask, yes. But expect, I don't think so. Okay, more cases on services, moving to the other side of the United States, uh, to California, Long Beach, visited there. Um, here you have a 16 year old with intellectual disability. Normally he gets five hours a day of special ed instruction and suddenly in virtual learning, it got turned to four hours a day. And the district said, well, we just had trouble arranging for the services and the staff during the COVID closure. And the hearing officer said, I hear you, but you lose. Okay, and you know, there's a lot of hearing officers decisions like that. I sympathize, I understand, I hear you, I commiserate, I empathize, you lose. Because it's about the kid, you know, and uh, and the hearing officer said, the circumstances are unavoidable. I understand your problem, but you're gonna owe the student some compensatory services. So he ordered private speech services and 10 weeks of, of private reading instruction. And of course, it's difficult to argue that 20% 20 20 reduction in special ed services is in a material lapse. I will note that these, these, this, these part of this parent and the school district engaged in a nine day due process hearing to litigate this issue. You know what a nine day due process hearing costs? probably $200,000, $250,000, something like that, I'd say. In California, absolutely. In terms of the cost of the attorneys for the district, plus now you have to pay the attorney's fees for the other side, this is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Waterton Board of Education in Connecticut. Okay, so unsurprisingly, a student with autism, there's a six month closure of the school due to COVID. And for this 13 year old with autism, all he's given is some self-guided services in occasional virtual sessions. Sounds pretty sporadic. Uh, the school's attorney argued, we're relieved of responsibility to provide the full panoply of special ed and related services during the outbreak. 
he should have checked around because the hearing officer said, you can provide FAPE differently during the period of closure and virtually, but the FAPE duty itself is not reduced. This idea that you don't have a duty to provide the IEP services in some fashion, it's just wrong. I mean, that I think the district here was, was misadvised. And moreover, the hearing officer noted that in terms of the student's unique needs, apparently when you interrupted his education, it, it really hurt. It really uh, would cause him to regress. And so sporadic services were like no services at all. Now, apparently the hearing officer did note that the parent was very mean in their communications with a staff person, but nevertheless, they found that the district loses and awarded compensatory education, okay? Um, and you see, I'm gonna skip the Wisconsin case. I wanted to talk about Blue Hills because this is a graduation case. You know what I don't think, I and mean, I'm surprised there's not enough cases around the United States challenging graduation. Because I think at times schools graduate a student uh, when they're really, really not ready and they really haven't really, really met graduation requirements, but everybody's excited about the ceremony and so forth and they graduate. And, and the student also, the student gets very invested in graduating, the parent doesn't wanna challenge that. But at times I think that the graduation decisions appear to be kind of weak as, as IEP team decisions go. In this situation, the parent is disputing the graduation of this 18 year old with, with learning disability because she says the services during school closure weren't that good. And she is actually asserting that during the period of school closure, she got one Zoom session, okay? And it was with a reading interventionist that wasn't even trained in the program. Now the district said, true, we didn't provide but one Zoom session, but we offered compensatory services and we offered access to a virtual reading coach. So we offered something. And the district here curiously says, we should dismiss the case because it's really early on in the pandemic until school reopens. And the hearing officer says, no, I'm not gonna dismiss the case. Um, the dismissal without a hearing would be inappropriate. Now one would think the hearing officer would consider, well, the district did offer compensatory services and it's appropriate in some cases to delay graduation. Can a student who graduated in May of 2020, but missed out on two months of, of some special ed and related services get compensatory services? I actually think they can because they're entitled to that back fate. That graduation didn't necessarily erase that. And there's a couple of United States Department of Education letters that stand for the proposition that those compensatory services obligations survive graduation and even aging out in some situations, okay? Now, I wanted to cover a, a, a couple of cases of situations where the parent refuses to cooperate because I think that, I don't know if it's surprising or unsurprising, but there's been lots of situations that have been reported by my clients to me where the parents just, there was no communication. As the school closed and virtual services were initiated, they just never responded. And the student never logged on, not, not even once. And they wouldn't respond to text, emails, messages, nothing, okay? And there was a situation in Hawaii. Hawaii, although you know, not a big state, you guys are a fairly small state. I think your population is still under 300,000, uh, but, but Hawaii is also a fairly small state. I think only 1.2 million total, but they have significant amounts of litigation, which thankfully you guys don't have. Um, so what you had here in this Hawaii case was a very complicated student, a student with many multiple disabilities, medical, mental, uh, really, really challenging combination. And when the school closed due to COVID, <clears throat> schools scrambled, where can we provide services for this very complex student? The parents' response was refuse to have meetings, cancel meetings that are scheduled, refuse to cooperate, say, I don't wanna work with this provider, I don't wanna work with this provider, not respond to email, refused to provide certain consents that were necessary to access some of the services that were being proposed. 
And the hearing officer said the school was unable to get outside agencies involved because the parent wouldn't consent. So ultimately, the hearing officer said the failure to implement the IEP was caused primarily by the parent because she was completely uncooperative. It's a pretty stark situation, but I think that happens. And the hearing officer actually uh, was asked by the parent to order the school district to fund the home program she was doing. But the hearing officer said, but you failed to cooperate with their program and now you want your home program? You even you have even proven that it's appropriate for your child. So you dismiss the parent's complaint. That's a pretty, pretty extreme case. Uh, another District of Columbia case is you have a student with learning disabilities and speech impairment, and he's he's offered virtual services during the COVID closure, but he starts missing sessions, starts missing speech, missing speech, missing speech. The school's even offering makeup speech sessions. Do you need to offer makeup speech sessions that the student just is absent for without excuse? I'm not quite sure, but I think it's a good idea to offer makeup sessions. And the hearing officer noted the student's missing sessions, even though he was gift, you know, provided a laptop by the school, which the school district, as we know, legally isn't required to do. And so the hearing officer said, I'm not gonna penalize the school district for the student's absences here, particularly since they've offered makeup sessions. And, and the, the students just, he's just not participating. There is a situation where if you're not participating as a student and you've been given the opportunity and you've been offered makeup sessions, don't come here complaining about compensatory services. I think that's kind of like the fairness issue. Did you take advantage of the services you were offered? If yes, and they weren't sufficient, maybe you're entitled to comp. You didn't take advantage of any of your offered services and now you want a bunch of comp? I don't know, you might be out of luck. A couple of cases on remedies in the time that we have, um, moving to, to Washington State, to the other side of the United States, you have the Lake Stevens School District and and here the parents of a student with a bunch of a bunch of conditions, a difficult student you have, uh, and by difficult, I mean challenging in terms of the presentation of their disabilities, not attitudinally. This is an 11 year old and, and he's got intellectual disability and autism, um, ADHD, anxiety, mood disorder, speech issues. And the parents arguing he wasn't provided an appropriate education during the school closure and really needed a residential placement. But the problem was that no residential placement was available due to COVID. You know, across the United States, the residential placements that had kids had to send the kids back home. And the residential facilities, I mean, their staff, they closed in the same way that the schools closed. There couldn't be that proximity. And the hearing officer said, I'm not gonna award compensatory services because we can't estimate when he's able to return to a placement. We don't know when even a, a residential placement will become available. Why am I ordering compensatory services at this time? It seems premature. I might take the case under consideration later on, but, but the compensatory services must be determined once a student returns to school, which I think is an, an appropriate way to look at it. Let the kid return to school. Let's find out if they naturally recoup. Let's find out what the state of the data is in terms of their progress a few weeks after they return to school, okay? But I must say that other hearing officers have not been reluctant to award compensatory services even before the school reopening. Why the inconsistency? The legal system, the hearing officers, the courts, they're just, they're just dealing with the unprecedented nature and challenges that were foisted on special education due to the pandemic. And initially when something big happens, the, the courts and the hearing officers, they'll they'll be inconsistent. And, and in time, their decisions will coalesce against some, uh, around some consensus ideas, but not at first. And that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing currently. Check out this Georgetown case. This is uh, just north of, of my, my home uh, district here in Austin. This is just north of Austin. And look at this situation. Like other districts in Texas, the district closed uh, in late 
March of last year. Our um, positivity rates were, you know, jumped through the roof pretty, pretty fast in, in Texas. And, and it was not a good situation for quite a while. Things improved slightly. And then in the summer, things got worse, significantly worse. So we've, we've gone through actually some mini waves here in Texas. Initially, the parents uh, were offered speech through teletherapy, good, but only one session was provided to the student that normally got speech. Then the hearing officer said, speech teletherapy was discontinued for ethical and equity reasons. I don't get it. What does that mean? I spoke to the attorney for the school district and she said that the school felt that if we can't provide speech to all, we're not gonna provide speech to one, to some. That wouldn't have been my that wouldn't have been my call. My call would have been if you can only provide speech to some, provide speech to some. If if you you know, but the idea of we have speech therapists, but they're just no longer going to do speech services even on a teletherapy basis seems like a losing proposition. So speech was delivered only through online activities, and ultimately the speech therapist conceded, I can't measure his progress. It's not a good thing. The school was providing dyslexia services, which are, you know, regular ed uh, dyslexia services, reading services, but they changed it to a computer-based program and they put him on the wrong level for a whole month. Not great, not a good look, okay? So he doesn't access it very much and we can't measure his English progress. Uh, initially, he got some inclusion and social skills through synchronous online services, okay? In April, so, you know, March, late March, we go, we're in April. In April, the district proposes an IEP amendment for the during closure services. But look at what they propose. They propose online social skill services. Oh, we're going to reduce your dyslexia services from 45 minutes a day to an hour a week. Your, your speech is now going indirect instead of direct. And you're going to get your inclusion is now going to be reduced to 30 minutes a week through Google Hangout. And a hearing officer said the district prepared the IEP amendment without the, the input of the parent. And I didn't know that was necessary. The parent did disagree with the amendment and she said, I want an IEP team meeting. At the IEP team meeting, the parent legitimately and reasonably says, I want my four days a week dyslexia. I'm sorry, it was four days a week, not every. And, and I don't want that program that they put him on it. I want another program and I want my weekly direct speech. And the IEP team, which is an art committee in Texas, they said no. Um, no to implementation of the IEP. Uh, the hearing officer says you modified the services without the parent's consent. And you haven't yet determined whether the child needs compensatory services, but I know at the time of the hearing officer's decision, the school's not even open yet. So he actually has a problem with the district waiting until sometime after the student returns to school before deciding on the comp services, which the previous hearing officer just said, that's the thing to do. This hearing officer says, no, I don't like this idea of, of waiting. How can you actually analyze how much progress a student lost and quantify it and see if there's any natural recoupment when the student returns to school? Doesn't, doesn't, make, doesn't make a lot of sense. So the hearing officer says you failed to provide speech. That's true. You just chose not to do so. You failed to provide appropriate dyslexia services. True. True. And uh, the IEP amendment was inappropriate because it was a unilateral proposal made without parental input. I have a problem with that, okay? The way that I read the IEP amendment provision, it says a district can propose an amendment to the IEP and you send it to the parent and see if they agree. And the parent can agree or the parent can say no, or as in Texas, we say, hell no, okay? And I want a meeting, which is exactly what happened. You know, the parent was proposed an amendment, the school, this, the, the parents said no, so they had a meeting, okay? So I don't know what's wrong with that procedurally. He seems to think that to propose an IEP amendment, you have to meet with the parent before the amendment to get an agreement on the amendment. I just don't see that in the regulation. The whole thing about this is, is avoiding a meeting. I don't see what's wrong about the district unilaterally proposing an amendment and then the parents free to disagree as the parent did here. So I don't see the procedural violation. <clears throat> what I see 
is the district failed to provide services. So I fault the district, the hearing officer for some of his conclusions and some of his analysis, but I think the right decision here is that the district missed the boat. Providing an IEP amendment that provides minimal services, not close to what the IEP is supposed to include, that's a loser, that you can't do that. And I think a lot of districts did that. Watch out, I mean, did you, did, did you have students who normally got provided, you know, three hours of special ed instruction through the day and that got minimized in the virtual program to 30 minutes? Be careful. And it, generally, you're going to find that those students really missed out on a lot of progress and may be entitled to some significant comp. Okay, so uh, I don't think it's inappropriate for districts to wait until after the kids return to school to make a better and more appropriate qualitative comp determination. But this hearing officer seems to fault the district. Um, I don't know that that's the right idea. Again, disagreement between the hearing officers on here. Overall, I do, I do feel that the hearing officers do appear to be demanding that the schools provide the same frequency and amount of IEP services during the virtual sessions. So think on that, okay? Did you provide roughly the same amount of special ed instruction on a virtual basis that the student would have received on a live basis? Maybe the inclusion services were on a different format, but about the same time, then you're probably good to go. If you provided very abbreviated instruction, meaning you really condense the special ed into small amounts of virtual programming, and expected the parents to kind of fill in the gaps. I think those are the more dangerous situations. Danger in terms of you're ultimately gonna find, geez, this student, he's missed out on a lot of progress or he's regressed, or he's really not where we would expect him to be. By the way, on that point, okay, so a special ed student is not where we would expect him to be right now, had he been in life program. I've had some educators tell me, well, every regular education student fell behind. True, but the special ed student can't. He's got a federal statutory right to an appropriate education. And Secretary DeVos did not ask for fake flexibility of the Congress. She could have. She could have asked for some good faith standard, a modified FAPE requirement. She didn't. So the, the students are owed full FAPE as if they had been at school. And, and that's, that's the reality. Special ed students are not like regular education students. They have the backing of a federal law and the funding. Okay. If you have students that are, have shown resistance to participate, it's crucial that the school demonstrates their efforts to get students to participate. And I think that's a step process because you have to contact the parents and you have to get to the bottom of why is the student not logging on or why isn't he staying on, okay? Is it a home issue? Well, they're alone, okay? Um, is it that the parent is there but just isn't assisting? Is it that there's a need for some behavioral intervention, some positive reinforcement, something? Is there a need for the cha a change in the services? And, and you have to contact the parents and have IEP team meetings to figure out what the problem is and how you can attack the problem. I think that the, the losing situation is the child struggling, 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 not participating. We're just watching it, and not having an IEP team meeting to do something. And that segues into the point I'm making at the bottom, which is the IEP teams, as you provide virtual services, you're gonna, you're gonna encounter problems. Just like during live instruction, you go through a school year, fine, 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 now there's a problem and you have to address it through IEP team meetings. That's gonna happen when you provide virtual services and you have to be willing in the same way to meet and figure out how do we adjust the services to address the needs of a struggling student? You know, what's the problem? What do we, what do, we do about it? And it has to happen during the virtual program. I think um, you may have reopened by now, you should be thinking about addressing the special ed students who appears to be way behind who appears to have lost ground, who appears to not have made the progress that was expected. Because I think at, even at the start of the COVID closure, schools should have told parents, we will address potential compensatory services when the school returns face-to-face. -face. 
And as I indicated before, and I want to reiterate, you need to have a protocol in place for considering how are we going to make decisions on, on comp? What, what are the data points we're going to look at? Um, what, what is going to be the process? Do we pre, do look at the data and prepare a little report that's then presented to the IEP team, our art committee, or uh, what's the process that we're going to uh, look at? Because it's a two-step deal. You have to determine is comp service necessary? And to me, it's necessary if the student's not where they should have been, where they should be, had there been live instruction. And secondly, and can be a more complicated part of the analysis is what package of compensatory services will need to be designed to roughly get you to the same place, get the student back. And it can be through a combination of, you know, services during the summer or after school or before school or beefing up special ed services during the school day doing double speech for a little period of time until you catch up. Those, those are the kinds of ideas that I'm thinking about. Okay. Any questions on that while I take a drink? We are not showing any questions in the Q&A, Jose. Thank you, Ms. Eisenhower. You're welcome. I think this is an area though that if I were if I were all you I'd worry about because you, you can't tolerate the special ed students all of a sudden having regressed very substantially. At the very least, the kids that appear to be showing the most problems in, in, in functioning academically or otherwise when they get back to school, you're gonna have to have meetings and you're gonna have to decide how, what are we gonna do? Like my fear is the kids with autism who most struggle during the period of school closure will also struggle a lot as they get back because if they were out of school for a long time, you know that these kids can have difficulties with changes and then, you know, they, they probably had difficulty moving into the home environment for school and now difficulty moving back. I, I really, really feel, feel for these kids. Uh, check out this Los Angeles case. This is a different variety of case because this is a young lady that's kind of on the on the end cusp of, of her special ed journey. She's 22 and she's a senior with autism. And unsurprisingly, her IEP has uh, quite a few nice transition services, you know, to the to the um, to the benefit of the, of the school district in Los Angeles, largest school district in the United States is my understanding, I think 600 campuses or something like that. And this young lady had hands-on vocational instruction, so uh, community-based instruction, job training on the job, volunteer activities in the community. They really did a very nice job to get this young lady out in the community, which is what students with autism are gonna need if they're gonna get out there. Um, even the students that are more, more advanced. Um, I don't know if I've shared with you, I listened to an NPR story that just stopped me in my tracks. I, just, I, I had arrived at my destination, I stopped the car and I just listened through it. And the story was about very high functioning autism spectrum students who did very, very well in high school academically, were in special ed, and then they were expected to transition to college because they academically very, very proficient. And they went to college and couldn't make it through a semester. It wasn't the academic issues, okay? The academics were not the problem. The problems were that they had not yet built up the social and behavioral skills to really manage in the college environment, getting to school, navigating the campus, dealing with teaching assistants, dealing with your peers, and, and they drop out and these students were back at home on the computer a lot in their room. And that is sad, I mean, for these really highly capable students. And these parents were saying things were great under IDA until they're graduated, but then going into the adult system, you know, the, the, the colleges weren't offering a great deal of assistance, very minor accommodations, and, and that's it. So now I have my, my 19 year old is, is at home on the computer you know, a lot. And I thought it's really, really sad. So to the credit of, 
of Los Angeles, this student's getting out there in the community, they're really training her. But the problem is that when COVID hit, all of this went away. All of the community volunteer, the job training at, at the work site, the community-based instruction, obviously, sadly, all of that ceased. Um, but look how the IEP team reacted to it. The IEP team met and said, we're not gonna make any changes to the IEP. The student will continue to receive educational services by participating in distance learning until July, and then she's 22 and fly, fly. Um, of course, you know, I think reasonably the parent files a due process hearing request and the students made minimal progress on our vocational social skills or community skills goal during the period of school closure. But the, the school district was oblivious and they just said, We're, she's, she's gonna age out of the program. But wait a minute, what about all the services she missed out on, which are crucial? for her age right at a crucial time as she's segueing and transitioning out of, of, of the, the school environment. Um, the only thing they were offering her to satisfy the community-based instruction was a program where she visited interesting places online. How effective do you think that's gonna be, visiting interesting places online? It's just like traveling when you visit interesting places online. Um, and so the hearing officer noted that the online program provided less than half of the instructional minutes per week as her regular IEP and none of the transition services most important for, for successful transition. So the hearing officer was forced to find, we're gonna have to provide compensatory. But I said, but you know, and smartly he said, you know what I'm gonna do because it's right during the pandemic. So providing compensatory services that are live who knows when that's going to happen? But I so he said, I'm going to do compensatory transition counseling services, which can be provided remotely, which I think is smart, because otherwise it would have delayed the services for this young lady. And I think some kids need kind of immediate compensatory. I think this school was lulled by the fact that she was aging out and just thought, that's it. That's it. Once we, we run out the clock and we don't need to provide compensatory. Wrong. I do think compensatory services obligations can go even after the child has aged out, as long as you owe the child some fate, some back fate. You know, I think of comp as sort of like back taxes, and this is back back fate. Um, I wanted to contrast a couple of cases to close. Let me see where I'm at. I think, yep, yeah, pretty close to it. So just a couple more cases, if I can beg of your patience and we will close and, and I'll take questions. In this Indiana case, I'm pointing out that the federal courts generally say, if you're gonna provide compensatory services, it's not hour per hour or day per day, that's too easy. You have to figure out what progress did the student miss out on and what's gonna kind of catch them up. That's a more individualized and more difficult determination, but that's what should happen. And that, that is a qualitative approach to comp as opposed to quantitative, which is all just about quantity. How many hours of speech did you miss? You get, you get those back. And here, this student normally required 30 minutes a week of speech. And during COVID closure, he got none. The therapist would just uploaded materials. Uh, the student didn't respond, completed no task. Uh, the school was trying to contact the parents, but the student just wasn't doing anything. And the hearing officer did hour for hour missed speech. So he found you missed 270 minutes of speech, you owe 270 minutes of speech. Contrary to the idea of, of qualitative. And the hearing officer doesn't comment on the fact that the, the student failed to do any of the tasks that the therapist assigned and which should be maybe a determination. And I wanted to contrast it with Denver. And in Denver, this student misses 260 minutes of special ed services, but the student is a student who does his work and he gets his work done and he actually makes progress. And, and this student gets no compensatory services because he's, he, he did his work and, and made progress. So if you notice here, the diligent student who did his work and made progress gets no comp services. But in the Indiana case, the not diligent student who doesn't pay attention to anything that the 
speech therapist offers and doesn't do any of the work, he gets comp services. It doesn't uh, make my gut justice, uh, 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 you know, have a really nice feeling. Um, but, you know, like I said, initially these COVID cases are kind of all over the place. That how, that's how the law usually reacts to something new. And then they coalesce again around some principles. In the mid nineties, the ABA cases hit school districts for students with autism, the parents asking for one-on-one -on -one ABA. And initially the courts were responding in an inconsistent fashion to those requests. And then it coalesced against around some ideas and some consensus notions and, and things made a little bit more sense as far as the case law was involved. And I think that will happen with the COVID cases here. I hope that overall the discussion gives you food for thought on your virtual programs and kind of things to look for, things to worry about. I find that with special ed folks, you, you worry, you worry about things. But I find that a, part, a lot of what my task is, is rearranging your worry because sometimes you're worried about the wrong things. You're over worried about things that maybe you shouldn't worry so much about and you're under worrying about some things you really should be worried about. So I've, I'm kind of a worry rearranger and I hope I've, I've rearranged it in some fashion today. But we do have a few minutes. I know it's kind of later in the day, but Ms. Eisenhower, any questions that you see out there? Anybody have anything they want to ask before we close down for the day? There's nothing currently in the Q&A. Maybe people are tired, I don't know. If you think about this and you have a question, if you send it to Ms. Shipley or Ms. Eisenhower, Ms. Eisenhower, I'd be happy if you forward them to me and I'll, I'll be glad to respond. Sure, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Jose. Well, I wanna thank Jose Martin for sharing his knowledge and expertise with us today, very informative. Thank you, Jose.